my attorney goes, stop everything you're doing. Whoever you're working with isn't who they say they are. They're HBO and they're ripping you off. So you pop up the trailer for this thing. The first opening line is, do you want to be famous? Right. And then it cuts to an American Idol style casting audition, casting for influencers. I'm like, holy shit. All these guys signed an NDA. I'm going to be rich. So I'm like, I think this guy just commit malpractice. So I was like, holy shit. Like even these, even these attorneys are actors, you know, I'm like, everybody's an actor. Holy crap. My family friends, J Lo's music producer. And he wants me to come over and hang out. Next thing I know, his friends are putting my stuff on HBO, <laughs> you know, like, I, like, I don't know how else to put it, but like, I didn't think they were out to get me. I thought this guy, I looked up to him. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm going to be interviewing Jack Pugy, and he has a really interesting story about corruption and theft in Hollywood, which I know you guys are saying, stop it. That's not true. I, I agree they, that large corporations wouldn't possibly take advantage of anyone, but he insists it's true. So uh, we're here to hear his story, and I appreciate it. And if you like the video, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Leave me a comment. Do all the things that you know you're supposed to do, and I appreciate it. So check out the interview. I typically don't hit them up for a subscription at the beginning, but I really need the numbers. Yeah, trust me. I know how it works. So I, Listen, and I appreciate everybody that's stopping to listen and take the time to hear today, too, because, you know, that's all I'm trying to do is create awareness around this. And it's the sort of story that everybody has heard a million times. And I mean, you know, they made, there's a movie about it that jokes about it called big fat liar, where this like kid gets his homework stolen by a moot by a Paul Giamatti. And all of a sudden it turns into like the biggest flick of the season. Right. Um, but you know, it, it comes down to like this intellectual property. Like, well, like we're just talking. hold on a second. Cause like nobody knows who you are. So first to tell yeah. me, tell me, so tell me about yourself a little bit. Like we were born in, so Indiana, um, you got a mom and a dad, or you were raised by wolves, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. I, uh, um, I'm, um, I grew up in uh, Long Island, New York. Um, I grew up um, on the North Shore. Um, I grew up kind of like amongst circles of you know people in the entertainment business. Um, my dad was uh, my dad is in finance. Um, so I thought that growing up, you know, seeing my dad working in that industry, I thought I thought I knew the dirtiest business in the game. You know, I thought right. that it had to be there was no way, nothing more evil than, you know, working for the dollar. But um, it turns out that Hollywood is a bigger and dirtier cesspool. Yeah. You know? Oh, I say all the time. I'm like, I, I'd rather whenever I talk to these guys, I'm like, honestly, I would rather deal with criminals. Yeah, well, they are. That's where they all go. Right. I mean, I keep least, telling everybody I'm going to get killed over this thing. You know, I was going to say, listen, at least in prison, if things go bad, like somebody could get stabbed or, or beat up or whatever. But these people are they're in ivory towers and they've got tons of lawyers and security. And you're just not going to get to them. No. Nope. You know, even with even if you even if you had money and had your own set of lawyers, it's like, yeah, I'll outlast you. Well, that's you know, that's the best part about it is that my lawyer, you know, the, the premise here is that I I present I, I pitch these two shows and and they're on HBO oh. now. Hold on, sorry, I just realized why I'm lagging. Hold on a second, sorry, bro. No, listen, no. and I I tried to tell the guy that you that called me your assistant. I tried to tell him it's like not a professional operation. <laughs> don't, expect, <laughs> don't expect too much. So, um, no, sorry. yeah, I'm he just... had me all upset. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm taking, I'm taking the little Wayne approach. Little Wayne was featured on every artist across the board that would let him be featured on. And that's how he built his brand. Cause now you looked up little Wayne and, and everybody He's came everywhere, him, you know? Yeah. It's, it's kind of like Andrew Tate. I didn't hear anything. And then suddenly every, every other person was posting videos on him. That's the only way to do it. It's um, to do it. It's recognition. So you, so, okay. So tell me first, you, you wrote, so, oh, you so wrote some summaries about let's start, from, let's start from the beginning, I guess. We we're talking about growing up anyway. So my right. so I grew up um in this community amongst you know substantial people, I would say. 
and one of which was became a good family friend. Um, I, st I, I met him, I went to school with his daughter in the first grade. Um, his name's Corey Rooney. If you Google him and you know, you pull up some of his accolades, like Corey Rooney is Jennifer Lopez. He is Mariah Carey. He is right. Mary J. Blige. You know, he wrote every record for all of these people. Um, he's worked with Michael Jackson. And like, this was a guy that at six years old said to me, five years old, because I was young for my grade, five years old said to me, hey, you play the piano? Why don't you come over and hang out? And I was like, you're my parents age. Like, I don't know if I can hang out with you, you know? Right. But by the time I got to high school, I was like, holy shit, this guy is like a Grammy award winning multi-platinum record producer. And he wants to hang out with me. And he, and he, and he showed up to, he showed he used to come to my piano recitals. He came to, you know, I, I was learning, I, I was a DJ, I DJed for a time and it was, you know, just like, I didn't get to be creative enough. So it, it, what I didn't stick with it for long, but he came, you know, I, I did a club, a small little like club in Manhattan and he was there with, with, with his entourage and his family and his brother-in-law and like, you know, the, the, his, his wife and my mom were best friends for years and years. So like it was, you know, he was a family friend that I was just hang out with. And I looked up to him, you know, I mean, how could you not? Right. Like I'm, I'm in high school, I'm 16 years old, I'm, I'm 15, 16 years old. You know, my mom's dropping me off at his house to hang out with and because I wasn't old enough to drive. And I wanted to be in that, you know, industry, not knowing how or what and how it worked. And, you know, I'm sitting with him and we're hanging out watching the Nick game. And, you know, you get the phone call and he's like, yo, Puff, what up? I'm like, Puff. Right. He's like, yo, Puff, say what up to my boy, Jack. I'm like, am I talking to P. Diddy right now? You know? <laughs> and that was like, that was like my high school around this thing. So I'm like, wow, this is really something I'm, you know, have the ability to be a part of. This guy's, and this guy's like so generous with his time with me, you know? So I, um, I chased the dream. You know, I chased what was my dream was to like follow and follow and, and and end up in this business. And like, you know, I worked for a few years with my dad and it wasn't really the, you know, it, finance. You went, to, you went to school, right? You went to college. I went to school. I went to school. Like I, I went to school down in Florida. Actually, I went to school in Boca. Um, I uh, left school. I graduated. I went home. I worked for worked worked it in finance with my dad for a bit saved every penny and stayed home. And, you know, while most of the kids were around me were all moving out and doing their own thing and like, you know, starting their own lives. We graduated college. They got careers. They were working nine to five and punching a ticket to make somebody else rich. I was like, I had a, I had a mentor in college that taught me how business worked. And this was a friend of my dad's from, from high school age. And, um, he built, he built, he built one of them. He went to the same school I went to. And when I was down there, he used to come down and hang out. And he said, when I first started in college, he said, so what are you studying there? I said, entrepreneurship. He goes, you're going to learn that from a book, <laughs> really old school, like Italian delivery, sort of a guy. You're going to learn that from a book. Well, I don't know. He goes, I'm an entrepreneur. You want to learn how to be an entrepreneur? I'm going to teach you how to be an entrepreneur. So that was it. He took me under his wing and he taught me business, you know, better than somebody at my age should have known. And it was all about, you know, engaging in the, in the mentor. I always believed that you learn so much more from the person doing it than the person reading it to you, you know? Right. And, and uh, I followed... I followed, so I follow, so I, so I, so I came back home. I finished school. I worked and I saved every single penny and I lived like I was still on a college budget for like three years, saving every dime, I, every possible dime I had. During COVID, the world, the world changed. I started to look at the world and realize, like, you know what? If I don't pick up now and do what I'm passionate about, I'm never going to do it. I'm just going to sit here and punch the ticket like everybody else. It's just, it wasn't working for somebody. wasn't for me. Right. So I, uh, 
I took all of my, I took all of this money I saved up, which I invested properly. And like I doubled and I did, you know, I like, I was in finance. I was dealing with it. I was playing, I was playing the market. I saw what was, I saw trends and what was going on. And like, I, I made a couple of good calls. I made some bad ones too, but I had enough that like, I could have produced my own reality show. Okay. And that was the premise. So Corey set me up with some of his um, buddies in the industry. Unbeknownst to me, these guys Corey were the guy. Now, Corey, Corey is the guy from high school, not the mentor. Yeah, Corey's, Corey mentored me too, but Corey's the record producer. Okay. If you Google Corey Rooney, you're going to, you, you're, 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 you know, your eyes will pop out of your head when you see, you know, every song he's created. Okay. Um, because everyone was a hit. Um, and so I came out. So I, so I went and spent some time. He moved, he moved from our community here out to LA after high school, when I was in college. So after college, I went out and I spent like a, a weekend with, it was like three days. He was like, you want to make, cause I wanted to make a movie at that point. He's like, come out, hang out. We'll do whatever. So I showed up and like, I, the last thing I wanted to do was like, take too much of their privacy away. And I was like, they had me at their house. And I was like, I'll be here. I was like, I won't stay long. I'll be quick. You know? And I think they were like, you're leaving already sort of thing on my way out the door. I was like, yeah, you guys showed me what I need. Like, thank you. I came back and he had set me up before this. He had set me up with some of his buddies in uh, film and TV. I didn't know who these guys were. Unbeknown to me, these guys had were HBO, you know, they had, but, but, not in the way you thought they were because the way that these production companies operate is where like the illicit structure sort of begins. You've heard like the Chappelle talking about, um, have you seen Chappelle's Unforgiven? Yeah. Where he talks about how like he got fucked by the, by the industry and the industry's fucking people the same way in the as the me too movement. Right. So he, so he had this adage where he said that the, the Me Too movement was exposing how uh, the beast fucks physically, but I'm talking about how the beast eats. And, but it's still the same monster, you know, where, where the, they're just, it's just getting, robbing the, robbing the artists, robbing the creators. He once conned Bank of America out of $250,000 using nothing but a fake ID and his charm. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. So a, a lot of people think that uh, for uh, Netflix, and it's a Netflix original. They think Netflix did it. Netflix didn't do it. Several people came to Netflix, several small production companies or large ones came to Netflix and said, we've got an idea. Yeah. They, give them, they tell them the idea. Maybe they show them what's called a sizzle reel. It's like a three minute kind of a trailer thing. Netflix says, so it's going to be kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. We like it. We've talked to this person. We have this person willing to star, or maybe it's a documentary. You know, this person can talk. This will talk. They'll talk. We've got these experts lined up. It's going to be a three part series. So they say we need $6 million or 5 million or whatever it is. They give them a budget. Then these, then they come back with the finished product. Then Netflix says, "Hey, it's a Netflix original because they, they, semi kind of produced it or they kind of watched over it. They agreed to put up the money, and then they put it out there. But then suddenly you find out later that the story was purchased or borrowed from somebody else. And now Netflix has the ability to say, "Wait a second, we the production company brought it to us." We don't know what the production company did to acquire that storyline. We thought it was written by this person. Now, this person saying they wrote it. Apparently, they were partners. They broke up. They, whatever the case may be, there's always kind of a plausible deniability, whether Netflix knew it was an issue or not. And that happens, across, in my opinion, that happens across the board. I'll, I'll give you an example for me real quick. And this is a small example because I have a large one. Story. Huh? Everybody's got this story. This is why it's so recognizable. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm working with production companies right now who told me do not pitch device. They oh. told me don't pitch device because they've had they personally, the guy I'm dealing with has had 
I think one pot, he now says there's two stories. They went to them, pitched them two stories, both the both times they said, we're not interested. A year later, both series were made by Vice. And the thing is, he doesn't want to do anything about it. Well, I don't want to be one of those guys that's known to sue. Right. Because now, now, exactly, because that's the whole, that's what they try and scare you into is don't sue us because then you're not a part of the gang anymore. Right. Yeah. Fuck that. So, um, that's why, exactly. Like, that's in my, what I'm doing. Right. In my case, I'll tell you what happened with me real quick. This is just my vice story. And I got, oh, I've yeah. got a bunch of them. So, my vice story is I was contacted by a producer, female producer. She said, Hey, we'd like to talk to this person, John Boziak, which is a guy, a, a credit card counterfeiter that I wrote a story about. He was in his teens um, doing carding and it, it, it evolved into counterfeiting. So they had read the story on my website. And I said, I've already optioned his life rights. We're working with a production company. And I said, what are you looking for? She said, we're looking for teens. We're doing a program called I Was a Teen Felon. And I said, okay. And that's a big, big one on Vice. And I said, well, I got another guy. His name's J Jacob Diaz. I wrote a story. It's called The Unlikely Narco. And I said, I can put you in contact with him. And she goes, let me read the story. She went, read the story, came back. She said, it's amazing. She said, I love it. Mm -hmm. um, she said, I definitely want to talk to him. I said, okay, well, wait, calm down. I said, I, I said, I don't mind doing that, but let's get something on paper. And she said, what do you want? I said, honestly, I've already written the story. You can tell it's like 8,000 words. It's a done deal. It's easily fills your whole one hour. Yep. I've done all the research. I've got all the quotes. I got the whole thing. I had it laid out. And she goes, no, it's perfect. It's, it, it's done. I said, I'd like to be an executive producer. And I'd like, I think I said 20 grand, which is very is reasonable. Very, very reasonable. Right. And she said, I think like what she goes, I think I'd probably get you 10. And I said, listen, I live in Florida. 10,000 is basically 20,000. I'll take 10. Um, I live cheap. So she was like, okay. She said, can I at least, she goes, can I talk to the guy just to make sure that he's willing to participate? I said, sure. No problem. Gave him his email. I emailed him. I'm going to have somebody talk, call you from Vice to set to um, make sure that you'll be interviewed. And I said, by all means, I said, um, let me know how things go. He said, no problem. A week goes by, two weeks go by. I shoot him an email. I don't get a response, which isn't abnormal for him. Mm -hmm. um, he's restarting his life, got out of prison. He's, you know, a little scatterbrained. We've had on and off talk, you know, we talked on and off. Then I said something to her, and she says, hey, I sent him an email. Didn't I copy you on it? She sends it again, and she said, I'll let you know what happens. I said, okay. A couple weeks go by, I sent her another email, nothing. I think maybe nothing happened. Six months go by. This is a fast turnaround. Six yeah. months go by, because usually it's not six months. It's a year, two years. So six months goes by, and I'm talking to a buddy in prison. He says, bro, I just saw Diaz's story on vice i can't believe you sold it what Damn. what was it called it was called the cartel kid so i look it up sure enough they did a one hour interview with him um so i then of course i then turn around i send her an email saying i'd love to understand what happened here now nothing happened she doesn't respond of course i, not. I then go on concrete oh concrete. shit on danny yeah, Danny, we do like a one hour special, right? I talk about, actually, we didn't even do an hour. We just talked about it during the course of another story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I got to go back and watch that. I love Danny. So he then took a clip how Vice ripped me off or something like that. And it's That's like cool. 11 minutes or seven minutes or something. He put it out. Like two days after that came, comes out, I get a, I get a, immediately get this call from a lawyer with Vice. Well, with the production company. Hey, we were wondering, we'd like to take care of this. We <laughs> like to... So next thing I know, and, and we're talking about within immediately, yeah. like, you know, she said, by the way, I don't know if you realize this, you did get a credit as a, as a, um, as a, like a contract producer or something or a consulting producer. I said, yeah, we're supposed to be an executive producer. I don't know what a consulting yeah. producer is. I said, and it's, I said, and I, I just so happened while we were doing the whole thing, Danny, see, they see it. I didn't even see it. And, and, but I did see it later, you know, when they stopped it. And I was like, okay, yeah. But I said, what about the, the fee? We don't know anything about a fee. I said, really? I mm -hmm. said, let me be very clear. 
I said, I, I, I get it. I understand what's happening here. I've been through this before. I said, so let me explain to you what happened the last time I went through this. So last time I went through this, I was in prison. I filed a lawsuit. I said, they didn't think they could do anything. I said, I filed a lawsuit. I filed a lawsuit. I said, from in prison, paying guys with mackerel, packs of mackerel, which is like a dollar a pack, packs of mackerel and stolen paper and recycling and just um, recycling stamps and doing all these things that you can do to make to, to keep your cost down. I said, for less than $200, I cost Warner Brother two or three hundred thousand dollars in legal fees. I said they could have come to me and offered me fifty grand, but they didn't. Nope. They'd rather spend two or three hundred thousand. I said, "Can you imagine what I'm going to do at this point right now after this phone call?" And she goes, "Listen, okay, look, I get it. I hear you. Let me make some phone calls." She comes back. They give me an offer, not what I should have gotten, but it was. It was, it was, it was enough to make me go, okay, fine. Now I know buddy better. I'll take my little bit of money and walk. I signed the paper. I walked away with a little bit of money, but that's my story. So I know what you're saying. Like I've had it happen much worse where it's like meetings, the whole thing, like you're involved. The next thing you know, you're out of the loop yep. and then suddenly things are happening. You're like, what the fuck has happened? Oh, wait till you hear the rest of mine. Okay, great. Now <laughs> I, want to, I definitely want to hear yours. I'm sorry. I just want to tell no, you. No, 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 no. Listen, it's, it's, it's that this is what it's all about for me is like now this is the angle I want to take it. It's not just me. Look, in society, in a very grandiose way of viewing, right? We're all in jail. Right. Okay. We're all, we're all slaves to the central banking system. Okay. Right? Right. Because no matter what, if you take this economic, like from an economic perspective and you go po political and whatever else with it, which is like, you know, always a talking point in today's day and age because politics have become a sport. And you look at it from that grand scale. Nobody, I don't care who you are, nobody makes money. They take it from each other. The okay. only person making money is the government because they're printing it. They right. can just make more whenever they want. And it's not even the government, it's the central bank. Right. So if we're all a part of this system of how do I take from you? How do you take from me? Then what makes you a criminal that had to go away and me not? Yeah, I, I hear you. That's a little simplistic, but <laughs> um, sure. you know, there's still a, a system set up. At no, least no, of a, course. But, but like, I think the problem, rule. yeah, no, I understand you. But here's the problem in dealing with these guys is that one, they know you're just excited to be sitting at the table. Yeah. So they take advantage of that. And having been someone who's taken advantage of pretty much every situation I could, um, which got me into prison, is that, um, is that you know, you're excited just to be there. And you're, they're, they are very professional. So and so you think, I'm dealing with someone who's a professional, and they're constantly letting you know, listen, there's not a lot of money here. We're definitely, but don't worry. We're definitely, you're, you know, we're looking at a few hundred thousand or we're looking at this much money or there's this percentage of that. We can't guarantee that, but typically this is what happens. And so as you're listing, you're like, they're very careful. They're very professional. There's oh, definitely know. money here. They're telling me it's reasonable. But the truth is, even the reasonable amount of money that you're willing to take, they want to screw you out of. Of course. And in the end, when you walk away with nothing or you're going, I can't believe this is happening and you go and get a lawyer and it's clear cut. What they did was wrong. You've got emails. You've got everything. The lawyer's like, yeah, I definitely think you have a case here. Give me $50,000. If I had 50, if they paid me, I'd have had the 50 grand and then I wouldn't need to pay you. I know. So, and that's just a start. If we go to trial, it's going to be a couple hundred thousand. It's like, so they maintain this ability. So go ahead. So what, what I had happened? One law firm, I, I had one law firm in the midst of this whole thing. They told me, if you want to fight this, it's going to be two mil. I was like, Two million dollars. I go. I'm 27. Where am I getting? To? At the time, I was 25. I was like, two million dollars. Like, who's writing that check for me? It just. Well, and, and here's the reason people don't realize that. So, if it's if you're in a if you're in a car accident. Yeah, nobody understands how the legal thing works. I know. Right. So, so if you're exactly. So, so when you when you lawyers lawyers are lawyers know right. Lawyers are the worst at this whole thing, but Hollywood acts just like a lawyer because they, because what the lawyer does is, well, there's only a 50-50 chance, right? They always got to tell you that at the end. Yeah. But, but when you're on your way up to like 
up to that, that's the same thing you're dealing with in entertainment is like this, hey, listen, it could get picked up. It might not get picked up. So, you know, what happened to me was I pitched this, I pitched this, I think reality shows suck. Okay. Yeah. Reality shows are the most boring thing in existence. I think that some of the biggest ones out there are like watching paint dry and I can't figure out why people like it, but But, it's the drama, right? From a subconscious and psychological perspective, it's the, it's the, it's the, what would I do if I was in that situation? Right. It's like me and football. I don't understand why people watch football, but I'd be a fool to to sit here and say that it's stupid and and, and nobody yeah. and it you know like obviously there's a huge draw there. Like the so Kardashians yeah, you. cash. So yeah. you know they're doing there's there's people like it. Something's working. <laughs> yeah. So that was my uh, mentality about it. My mentality was like, well, you know, if I want to create a reality show that's actually interesting. How am I how am I going to do that? So you know, I grew up and I grew up going to a school where all we did was write. We wrote and wrote. I mean, by by the time I was in the seventh grade, we were writing forty page essays like a couple of times a year. Okay. So you know, writing was just we got we got beaten over the head to learn how to write and to read and do whatever else. And I'm dyslexic, so it was. So, so am I. Oh my gosh! It was I, I mean, I went to a school for kids with learning disabilities. So I, that's the kind of college I went to. Okay. Which was which was the best thing ever, you know, for me, it was like, it was such a, it was a cakewalk to have like that handheld support. But I, but I had, I I moved schools a bunch growing up because I needed the support too. So I know, I know that realm all and well, but you, so being dyslexic, you already know, like your fantasy is so powerful. Yeah, definitely. We can, I think that we're more creative than most because of that. I mean, I, it's just my opinion, but I, no. you know, that's how I always saw it. So when I looked at, when I looked at my world and, and what I realized was, all right, I got to create a reality show, but what's, what's my reality about? And it came down to me looking around at these, it came down to, it came down to, we were in the middle of COVID and I'm what, and I'm, I'm sitting next to my friends on the couch every day. And we're trying to like figure out how to get these girls to reply as we like flip through the phone. Right. It was so right. simple. And there was one girl that I was like drooling over. She had like 250,000 followers. And I was like, how do I get her to reply? And I was like, well, it's simple. All I need is more followers than her. Right. How do I get more followers? And then the reality show was born. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to create this reality show where I'm going to recruit girls to be on the show. Cause it's a dating show. But I can't really have it be a dating show. It's got to be about being an influencer. So, okay. so the premise became, have you ever wanted to be famous? Who wouldn't have stopped when they saw that ad roll by on their Instagram? Yeah, I want to, you know. Yeah, every 15, 17, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old person, boy or girl wants to be famous. At least 50% of the population, I figured, was my goal. You know, right. now if I got all those people to follow me, I was going to use them. Tell them if you, as long as you follow me, you get to be you, you know you'll, you'll get an opportunity to be on the show. We're going to do all the casting from Instagram. So now I say to myself, but it's just not enough. What's missing? What's missing? And I look over at my friends and I was like, these guys aren't even friends, you know? Like they're just constantly cock blocking me. So I'm thinking to myself, I know that's what this show's about. This show is my like get back at these guys for always. And like, you know, we weren't looking for the same thing when it came to dating. Like, I actually just want like one girl, like I'm one kind of like, e- yeah. like, I just want it to be easy. I want it to be my, my best friend sort of thing. And these guys were like, yo, if you show them, if you show them that we're going to go do this and it's fancy or we do that or we go out for a nice dinner or look at, look at the view at the beach or like this or that. It was all about like how much money you could spend and, you know, the very like Miami-esque mentality. And like, it's, that just wasn't me. That wasn't how I was raised. You know, that, that, that was a, that was a byproduct. That's not something you like, just like use to as your fishing bait. So uh, I was like, I'm going to get these guys back for getting in the way every time. Like there was one or two girls that came across that maybe there was like a little more than I realized. And I was like, I'm going to stick these. I was like, I'm going to stick these guys for sticking me. So I created this secondary underlying premise where I was going to trick them 
into being on the reality show, thinking they were helping me to cast like America's Next Top Model. So the casting, a, so the casting process is a part of the show. The show. Okay. So the casting process would have been this like, hey, have you ever wanted to be famous? Now I lured in my audience members. Kind of like American Idol. How exactly. part of it. Okay. That's literally how I pitched it. It was American Idol, but my friends didn't know what they were doing on the panel. Right. They thought they were voting for the hottest girls. Then what I was going to do was exploit them for kind of like every time like I talked to a girl and then like had them come and like take the girl away sort of thing. And that was going to be like the endless, the endless play. Okay. So I, that's like, that's like a really bad, bad explanation of the whole thing, but it's like, a, it's my shortest synopsis I can give you. So I, so I call up these guys that, that Corey set me up with guys. I got an idea for a reality show. Um, sign this NDA, get it back to me. Let's talk. I'm ready to, I'm ready to go. I, I'll fund the whole thing myself. You know, I was going to spend every dollar I had on this thing. I was like, I will fund this. Like, cause I knew the only thing I knew from Corey is you got to own all the rights. 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 He drilled into me. So, and his example was always Beyonce. Beyonce owned 80% of her own publishing. Nobody could figure out how. So I was like, if I pay for the whole show, I own all the rights. So that was, that was what I thought. I didn't know right. any better. Right. So, but, I, but I figured I'd own most of them until, until uh, you know, the time rolled around. Right. Or they take the idea and go get the funding from somebody else. That's, so that's, you out. no. That's so now that's what happens, right? So right. I, so, so I, I call these guys up. I'm like, I want to own all the, you know, I want to shoot the full pilot. Corey said, shoot the full pilot. I'm shooting the full pilot. No, no, we only want to shoot a sizzle. Like, I hear you, but Corey said, I guarantee myself on a network if I shoot the pilot. I did get on the network right. <laughs> with the whole pilot. It just wasn't mine. You know, it was mine. They just took it. So so now, you know, I'm two weeks, these guys are like, all right, fine, fine. Because I wasn't being malleable. And, you know, un unbeknown to me, I wasn't being malleable. I just thought I was calling them and contracting them to do a job and I was going to run the job. You know, that was... That was my simple. So you, you felt like they were a work for hire. Yeah, that was how that was how I understood it to be. You know, the whole thing was work for. I, I didn't know any better, but yeah, I thought it was work for hire. So so these guys come. Uh, these guys tell me they're going to come back to me by the end of the week. I, I hear nothing. Then like a week and a half goes by, and I'm start now. I'm like, all right, let me double check, see what's going on. Oh yeah, hey Jack. Well, uh, sorry, huge project got thrown into our laps. Um, we're Lord. not going to put my problem, <laughs> right? So right. these guys are famous for mocking, making mockumentaries. In the end, they tell me, but all they do is tease me with the whole thing along the way, which is when it, where it gets nuts. So they, so they, so they go. We want you to work. Here's the next tease. Ready? We don't. We're not going to be able to do it, but we want you to work with a producer partner of ours. Jeff Cobelli, his production company is called Good For You. But when you go to his production company and, and you're in his studio, all over this studio, he's got the letters G-F-Y. Okay. okay. What's that acronym for? I mean, go what? Go fuck yourself? Yeah. <laughs> so go. I'm working with Go Fuck Yourself Productions. Right. Because they don't want, because they're like, go fuck yourself. We took your show already. Right. So now... I'm I'm on my second call with go fuck yourself. And, and, I, and they're like, Hey, listen, this crazy thing happened. You should check it out. It's called fake famous. You open up the trailer to this, to this show. It, it just came out. It's on HBO. We weren't really sure. Is it your show? Is it not your show? So you pop up the trailer for this thing. The first opening line is, do you want to be famous? Right. And then it cuts to an American Idol style casting audition, casting for influencers. I'm like, holy shit, all these guys signed an NDA. I'm going to be rich. That's like my initial thought, right? And now I begin this uphill battle to like fight against the entertainment business. And I realize these guys were, these guys could just continually played me. Not only that, Fake Famous comes out now. 
they credit this guy to be the producer because you know they they work the whole they know how to work the whole thing to make it appear to be what it's not. They 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 talk to me about how you can manipulate the recordings, you change you change costumes, you you change hairstyles, you change lighting, you change this, you change that, and all of a sudden you can film something over the course of three days that appears to have taken place over the course of a year. Right. right? So you can you can manipulate the seasons and all those sorts of things, which is exactly how they pumped the trailer out for this thing. Because they pumped the trailer out in two weeks. Right. They pumped the document entry out in a month. The documentary? You mean the, the fake famous? The fake famous ended up being a documentary because I pitched oh. it as a I pictured it as a documentary style reality show. All right. So documenting the process of becoming famous. Because so I so in the process of doing that, I recorded every single production meeting I had. Is this the same guys that is this the same guys that um, that you spoke like the same production company that you were working with did this? Yep. Same one. No, it's it, they're not credited on it. But but when so now I go do do all the back studying, figure out who were these guys, you know, and when I'm looking them up, one's got a credit on the Sopranos, one's one was a was a DOD for uh, for he was the director of development, which means that's the guy who stamps the green light approval whether or not this thing's going to air. Right. He was a partnered with Warner. Right. Warner's the parent company at HBO. Yeah, they're the worst. So now I know. So, so now I'm saying to myself, "All right, like," and 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 Corey gave me all these little ins and outs. Like, listen, everybody talks to each other in this business through their attorneys. So I reached out to them first. I was like, "Hey guys, you know, I really appreciate like that you guys thought I was good enough to be on HBO. That's in, like, you know, people work their whole careers and can't make it on HBO." Right. So I was like, "Thank you." You know, I was like. Is there any way I can basically I asked, like, is can I have credit for my work? Like I'll I'll keep writing for free. I just want think about the credit I would have having credits at 25 on uh, having produced something on HBO. Like that's mine. That's that's I'm the next Spielberg. Yeah, you're trying to salvage. it. You're trying to salvage getting fucked over. Right. I, I get it. Yeah. Too late because we don't know what you're talking about. Right. So now. The dating show element was missing though, because it was two separate shows. I wanted to marry him because that would have been way more of a roller coaster ride of drama, which would have been more of an entertaining reality show to me than what the typical project. Right. But it was all about casting my friends, right? So I I call them up. I call them up now. I went down to Miami to, for a weekend to meet up with one of my friends who lives out in LA and, and a couple of my buddies from here that we, but we all went to, most of us went to school in Florida. So we go down there. It's this, the kid from LA's birthday. His name's Garrett Morosky. And he's, you know, we're celebrating his birthday. We're going out, we're doing this, we're doing that. The next morning I wake up and I, and, and I had been out. I met this, I met this kid, uh, he was a YouTuber, a finance YouTuber that I knew. I met some artists. I met, I was like, guys, I, I got a bunch of people for cast. I called them first thing that next morning. I was like, I'm down in my, and they, and they wanted me to go watch fake famous, but I told them I wasn't going to watch it. Cause I was like, I don't want to watch somebody else's show. That's kind of like ours. There was a few red flags along the way. One of them having been right after I pitched this show and got passed off the GFY. I called my attorney to tell him, Hey, I need, you know, I had these guys all sign the NDA, but I need a contract for them now because they're going to, you know, we're going to do this thing. My attorney goes, stop everything you're doing. Whoever you're working with isn't who they say they are. They're HBO and they're ripping you off. I was like, you rep and I, and I had known previously that they represented HBO. It was, it was something he had told me like years and years prior. So I'm like, I think this guy just, commit malpractice, you know? Right. So I, I kept that on the back burner, right? Now, the next thing that came to, to was a warning was one of the meetings I went up to go to GFY studio up in uh, Peekskill. And on my way up there, the guy who was bringing me, who was driving me up, you know, he happened to know who they were. He happened to know the, the, the studio location. He goes, 
you know, Jack, do you know where you're going right now? I was like, yeah. I was like, my family friend set me up with these guys. Like, you know, it's probably all good, blah, blah, blah. And just be careful. You know, I've brought people here before. This isn't just, you should be careful. I didn't think anything of it, but I asked him later. He goes, you know, when I brought, I was like, so remember after the, I realized the shows were robbed, he goes, when you, when you told me to be careful about that place, like why? He goes, well, I brought somebody there once and they told me their job was to, that, that they filmed porn up there. And their job was to use the flashlight while they were filming when they needed like spotlighting. <laughs> this guy's telling me, so I'm like, all right. So that had so, been red flag number two. That, 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 I, wasn't, that wasn't why you were going out there. Yeah, it wasn't right. at all. I was going up there to get robbed, but. Right. So now, so now, um, so now, you know, I had two red flags. This next red flag comes when I, these guys tell me about fake famous. I was like, I'm not going to watch that. Thanks for the, thanks for the look, but you know, I'm going to make my show. They didn't really know what to do with it. Like on all those video recordings, they kind of freeze. They're like, uh, well, I'm going to watch it. So you should probably watch it. Like they're trying to, they were trying to edge me in, you know? Well, so I don't understand. Why didn't you sue immediately? I tried. I, uh, uh, I okay. tried. I called hundreds of attorneys and they right. all told me, sorry, kid, you just, this is how it goes. Yeah, 50, they want 50,000 up front, maybe. Or no, the, 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 I, every attorney I talked to basically represented HBO. They didn't want to go up against HBO. The attorney I finally found that we're dropping this case with had the set of balls that I was looking for from, from the get-go. He goes, I don't play golf at their country clubs. I don't give a shit who we're suing. Right. So I was like, you're the man. Um Okay, so I'm but because we never really explained this, let, let, let me explain yeah. um, real quick. If so, a lot of people, because they watch, you know, they watch TV and they, they, they think they understand how the law works or how hiring an attorney look, works. Oh the, the problem is if you're in a car accident and let's say I'm in a car accident and some, you know, whatever, a Walmart uh, truck hits me or even if it's a family of four hits me from behind or and it's clearly it's their fault. Mm -hmm. Lawyers will line up to take that case, oh, yeah. provided they have insurance or money. And there's money there that could be gotten. Lawyers will hot will will um, they'll line up because and to take a third because they figure I know that you went to the hospital. I know you spent a day in the hospital, two days. I know you broke your leg. I know you were out of work for a month and a half. I know this caused you pain. We have photographs at the scene. It was clearly the other person's fault. They have State Farm insurance. I know that I can get you. $200,000. I'll take a third of that and I'll put up all the money to fight the lawsuit. And the average lawsuit in a personal injury case takes between 12 or 12 to 18 months. So they know that they know they can get their money back right away. It's worth them putting up 5,000 of their own money because they're going to get $60,000. If you, they get you a $200,000 settlement, they'll get $60,000. And they're always working these cases. They're getting new cases every month. So it's worth them to put up their own money to get that money. So it's a huge return for lawyers. And that's why they're always willing to do a third. Now, here's the problem with Jack's case. Jack's case is an intellectual property lawsuit. And this is the problem. Even if it's 100% ironclad that the other party stole from you, you can prove it for sure. They, these cases drag out for five, six, seven, eight years. And that means that the lawyer you hire has to come out of pocket hundreds of thousands of dollars to fight the case. And in the end, a large corporation like Warner, Sony, HBO, they could bankrupt that attorney. So that attorney typically says, look, I cannot take this on a contingency. Yeah. You have to pay for this up front. And so they say, look, it's going to cost whatever, 200,000, 300, a million dollars, maybe like you just said, 2 million if we end up having to go to a trial. And that's why a lot of these cases. So I'll give you an example of the, uh, the Hulk Hogan case. Mm -hmm. So Hulk Hogan, one, he has the money to fight it. So when, and that's why you see things like Hulk Hogan went to trial, the companies lost at trial 
and they get this $110 million lawsuit. And you think, come on, man, you didn't cost Hulk Hogan $110 million. The truth of the matter is, it's really to punish that company because by the time the jury heard that entire thing, and it had been eight years since Hulk Hogan's sex tape ended up on the internet, and they knew what they did was wrong, yep. and they 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 did do harm to him, even though, was it $110 million in harm? No. But the point is, is that they're trying to say, look, we're trying to get these companies to stop doing this. Yeah. And so in in Jack's case, in my case, the f- times that I've, stuff's been stolen from me, you're at su- as, a, as a small person, you're at such a, a disadvantage. Now, look, here's what won't happen. Sony Productions is not going to steal from HBO or from Warner because they're, they're equals. They can't, they're, they'll fight it out and they'll, right, they'll settle immediately. Yep. Those cases don't go, they're not protracted legal battles. Those yep. are things that are like, hey, fellas, let's just get together. Yeah, hey, let's exactly. Right. We're not little people. We're not I'll someone. Meet yeah, I'll meet you. they meet each other at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and we smooth it all over, and they right. trade. They but trade you're at a, you and I, people like you and I, are at a huge disadvantage. They tell us right. So I, I can see exactly why you were like, "Look, I'm just trying to salvage this. Give just give me credit. Just give me credit. That was all I asked, and I just asked for it. I knew I had them by the balls, and remember, I was videotaping everything. Right. Everything. So every time they mocked me, every time they acted like it wasn't mine, you know, one of the recordings, one of my favorite recordings, the guy says to me, oh, they didn't even have the idea. Right. Who had the idea? Right. <laughs> you know, so one of the, one of the, but, but the, but the reason I really, really knew I have had this thing was because of the attorney. So I knew when my attorney told me you're getting robbed by HBO, right? Who, who knew better than him? Right. And what's so, so that, funny is that people people hear that and they think, "Come on, man, why would they do that?" I don't know. No, no I I do, because now they turn around, they make fifty million dollars, and you're not even. A, and people are like, yeah, but it's so obvious. Yes, but don't you understand? He's not in a position to to do anything about it. The right, most right, he right. can do is scream and holler, and most other people in the business will tell him, yo, you don't want to do that because you, you'll have other ideas. You can get yeah, in that's what they tell you. Yeah. That's what everybody yeah. tells you. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. It's like, well, you know what? You can't cancel me. I'm already canceled. Yeah, right. <laughs> the only that's thing I can do is, is use it as a springboard. That listen, that's what I've done every time. I every time I get an opportunity to talk about it, I'm gonna talk about it. I at least at the very least, I want you to know you're not stealing from me. Yep. That's you're it. not stealing from me with no repercussion. Right. Look, I just yeah, exactly. You just want to be treated fairly. Like, like, look, what the smart thing would be to do is say, hey, utilize me. Dude, I've said all I said was put my name on my shit. Right. Put some, you know, that there's that that was that meme that went around a while. Put some respect on my name, you know. This is all I was all I was asking for was credit right i didn't even ask for money and i had every right to ask for money now i'm asking for money right on your project now i'm asking for money now i'm asking for money and everything that's rightfully mine so so what happened so now you've got the lawyer he's telling you your hbo stole from you yeah so my attorney Loeb and Loeb, which is a big time white collar law firm you know they are like i i had a big retainer up with them I had a ten thousand dollar retainer up with them, which isn't you know isn't chump change for a kid. Right. You know the way I look at it, I, I I still look at myself as a kid. My dad keeps telling me you're a man. People are going to treat you like that. I'm like yeah, but they still look at you like you're young. You don't know. You get wet behind the ears. Right. But it's all make it's always about making a deal, right? So so I so I so this law firm, this thirty year veteran, tells me you're getting robbed by HBO, and I'm like, how could you possibly know that? You know, unless like, and and how could I be getting robbed by HBO until, until good for you productions, GFY tells me, Hey, go check out the show on HBO. Right. Nah, it didn't even click at that moment. It clicked after I called them and told them about my friend Garrett and that I'm down here for his birthday and that, you know, I met, I have him for cast and I have all the other cast members that. They call him two hours later and cast him to be on the dating show. Two hours later, I called them at nine o'clock in the morning. You're not even going to let me leave town. 
No, they ha- I, they it was almost like they had they had to mock me. They needed me to know that they took it. You right. Know? So his girlfriend says to me now, I pitched this whole thing as a documentary style reality show. They told me on the audio, that's a novel concept. We've never heard of it before. So his girlfriend, who's like a rea- who was on one episode of Love Island before she couldn't even make the cut, says, uh, says, um, we're what her and I, her and I and him are walking around this pool looking for a place to sit. The whole place is packed with this at the SLS in, in Brickle. And amongst, you know, just it was a Friday afternoon and it seemed like nobody worked. And uh, I want to say it was a Friday. Anyhow, it was a few years ago. So now she says, so I'm, I, her and I are only walking now. I had no idea where he went. He just completely disappeared. Didn't say a word. I, I was like, Lauren, where did Garrett go? She's like, oh, you didn't hear. Like, hear what? Right? She goes, well, he's going to be on HBO's first ever documentary style reality show. And I was like, and I, I get the chills right even now saying it because I could feel like that moment of like, oh, my God, he's going to be on my show. Right. So I reach in my phone. I reach in my pocket. I pull my phone out. I like I YouTube it really quick. I'm like fake famous. Right. That's what they told me. It was called yet like two days ago. I was like, this is it. This is the show. He's going to be on it. He's going to be on. And she's like, really? Like, how do you know? And she, and she like actively watched this trailer. I was like, this is my show. He's going to be on my show. He's gonna be on. And I'm watching the trailer for the first time with the phone in her hand. Like, <laughs> he's going to be on my show. I have a show on HBO. I like, I lost my cool. I was, I mean, my friends thought I thought I was like clinically insane that day. But, you know, they didn't live my life. I was like, they made this thing so quickly. I can't, right. I couldn't even fathom. So I was like, they made the show without me. I got to right. give, make myself somebody now. So I ran the Instagram ad that I wanted to run when I was going to shoot the thing. I run this Instagram ad. Hi, I'm Jack Uji. I'm the executive producer at Flip Productions. Have you ever wanted to be famous? <laughs> this thing took off. This, the ad went, the ad went nuts. I got like 18,000 views like overnight. And then I, and then I paused it and I took it down because I was like, I was, I was getting comments from the guy who supposedly was the, was the credited guy on this thing. His name is Nick Bilton. He's a journalist. So now I knew I had them. I call, I had hired another attorney when my, when my attorney seemed that a friend of mine's dad was a, was an entertainment attorney. So I hit him up too. And I was like, yo, I, I have Loeb and Loeb. They seem a little sketchy. They're telling me about their other client. He goes, yeah. And they're expensive. It's like, I'm only, I'm not going to be that much. So I was, you know, my friend's dad, it was comfortable. So I call him up. I'm like, dude, I got robbed by HBO. These guys were HBO. They Loeb told me. And, and he just, this was like a, like a little beyond him. He, he ultimately told me, he's like, I, I, you know, I haven't dealt with something like this. Right. He's like, but why would they do that? If they signed an NDA, you own them. And, and that's when it clicked that I had to figure out how this worked. And I said to him, well, I'm going to call back Loeb. He goes, good. Then, you know, keep, keep recording, record them too now. Right. So, So now I call up Loeb and I record them and I get them to admit on the recording, like, they tried to, they, they basically asked for representation. Just me asking them questions. They asked for representation. They said, this isn't, this really isn't going well. I got to get somebody else on this call. Okay. Because I, I called them out, you know, I had these two partners stuttering over each other. And I was like, you remember our last call? Like you guys told me this, this all sounded a lot like the HBO, what was going to be on HBO sounded like the, you know, whether I pitched the dating elements or I pitched the, or I pitched the influencer elements and we get on, I played it coy and they, and all of a sudden I was like, so I want to talk to you guys. You guys said, I like, like, what's up with this fake famous, the guy pretends to Google, you can hear, he's like, he's not even, the keyboard's not even clicking. Right, right. And he goes, F-A-K-E, F-A-M-O-U-S. Okay, now I got it pulled up. Like he never said it to begin with. Like he didn't know it. This is the first he's hearing about it. Yeah. So I was like, holy shit. Like 
even these even these attorneys are actors you know i'm like everybody's an actor right they're all yeah they're all they're all protecting their own ass so now so now i get so he goes i never said any of this i don't know did did you say this he passes it off to his partner and his partner goes uh no but maybe we did because it was in the tray within the day or so before the call i was like bingo you know now i got my attorney admitting they told me about this that they may have told me about yeah, this. maybe yeah. yeah he's covering himself with maybe i don't recall i'm maybe. not sure. right. but like come on you wouldn't have said maybe if he wasn't like the the layman when you're showing this amongst the court of in to peers like the, just because he said maybe people are going to are they going to are people going to believe it or not you know right well so, i think people people they don't believe in coincidences especially with something like this it is I got you know, five it, coincidences already right here right you know and, and and once you hit a five, once you hit five coincidences, probability says there's a 99% chance it's no longer coincidence. Right. So then what? So so we didn't even get to the dating show, but now I now I got these guys pinned. And and I'm like, you know, and, and I'm videotaping everything. So I was like, you know, throughout the process, I'm like, I'm really gonna actually make the documentary about how to become famous now. You know, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna if this whole thing is a story like Tiger King was right, I got, I, um, you know, it's the same as that movie, big fat liar. I was referencing where the kid is, uh, gets ripped off by the Hollywood producer. Right. And he videotaped the guy admitting it. So I go through, so now for months I'm playing on the defense with these guys. I kept changing ideas. I mean, they got really impatient with me. I, I kind of felt bad for the amount of time I wasted at some point, but they ripped me off. So I had to, so I built my evidence. So I slowly questioned and asked all these things and I slipped it in. Like I was get, feeding them more information, but I wasn't really feeding them information anymore. And every call we had, I would change the concept. Then I blew off a call because I wanted to see what would happen. Next thing you know, my friend Garrett calls me from the set. Kids only got 20 minutes a week to use his phone, supposedly. On a bunch of the podcasts he talked about after the fact, he said, we didn't even have phone access. We were isolated. So who knows which one's true, but one of which one of which uh, must be. And if he had 20 minutes a week, he used, he used it to call me. Right. Uh, you know, he wasn't calling his mother. Like, so, so, uh, and, and, and when I cast, when I, after they cast him to be on the show, I run back an audio for him of one of my interviews. I played the guys, I, I played, I played the, all the team members at GFY and I didn't play any information that was content about the show. I made sure to like really pick what I was showing him. And I play back three seconds of the man's voice, the woman's voice and, and the other guy's voice. And at the woman's voice, he's like, play that back. I mean, I played it back for him 15 times and he goes, I really think that's who cast me. I was like, okay, sign this NDA and will you testify in court if that that's true? He's like, of course. Like I got, you know. It's like, what are you talking about? I just got casted. I'm gonna be a big Yeah, that's guy. what he tried to spin it with when I when I recorded him. So I have I have an interview I did with him for like two hours that I just I just wanted to make sure I got him admitting it. I was like, yo, Garrett, really, as my friend, you're going to spin this now and say that that didn't happen. Yeah, no, it, it did. It did. So I like, I covered my, I, but I couldn't, I couldn't believe I'm like, he, you know, everybody's out for themselves no matter yeah. what, you know, it's so you th really think people are your friends. So I, so I, uh, I, so I slowly start piecing this thing together and I'm calling hundreds of attorneys. I mean, Will you take this? Will you take this? Will you take this? Some of them like you got 20 hours. No, who want to watch 20 hours of footage? You know? <laughs> so so I so after like six months, I was like, you know what? I gotta clip out the elements and put them together for them. Right. So I ended up going to this. I went to this one firm in the city that I play back the the footage for this guy. And I, 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 I spent like three weeks. I clipped out all these important things and it's like very rudimentary editing. And, but it's like, you know, the guy goes, yeah, they didn't even have the idea. Oh yeah. You can make the show in, in three days and make it look like it took place over the year. Oh yeah. We had enough time to edit that, to make that documentary. Uh, 
I showed, I showcased the lawyer committing malpractice. That's when like, they all, they all like perked up on the edge of their seat. They're like, wait, we can make some money with this kid. But same thing, like you said, if you're not going to pay us, not going to pay us 35 grand. We then, can't wait five years to get a settlement. And they wanted, and they were like, we're going to, we want to do this tight and quick. We want to go after the attorney for committing malpractice. And then, and then, you know, we'll back into your credit like that. I'm like, dude, I want to go after the law firm too. Cause you know, I have my own issues with the law firm, but like, I got to get credit, man. If I don't get credit, then I don't have a career. So I uh, just kept on the horse and I, and I, when I finally was at the point a year and a half in of like, I, I can't do this anymore. I started calling PR firms. I was like, I got to just build a reputation for myself. The first PR firm I call, he goes, well, have you hired a lawyer? <laughs> I was like, man, I just spent like, I just called 110 of them. He goes, no, nah, you just didn't call the right ones. Call this guy. And I call him. He's like, yeah, I'll take it. And that was it. Like from then on, I've been, you know, this putting it together for like the last eight months and, you know, tomorrow's launch day. Oh, okay. What do you mean? What's happening tomorrow? Tomorrow is when we drop the suit. File a lawsuit. Yeah. With a, the complaint. The, the complaint. Yeah. Um, I mean, we sent them letters, you know, Hey, I have, I mean, my friend Garrett calls me after the show. My friend Garrett was in on it by the end. He, had, right. he calls me and he goes, Hey, what's up? I just won your show. You know, I, like that's <laughs> I I won your show. like I have this shit on recording, dude. <laughs> and then I have another one. He goes, come on, bro. We know what happened. They just took, they just sold the show. I'm like, great. You're going to. Yeah. You're okay with that. Like, like, yeah. like you're my buddy. You're okay with that. Yeah. Like basically I mean, he's telling me, Oh, just move on. They sold the show. I'm like, dude, like, and he's like, he's like, I got fucked out of money too, which, which, which is the, the, this is the, this is the most ironic part of the whole thing. The kid goes on the show, right? They film this whole show. If he dumped the girl, he got a hundred grand in the end. If he picked to split it with the girl and stay together, they split 50. He dumped the girl for the 50 grand for the hundred grand. Right. He calls me to tell me he won the show and then he won the hundred grand. Right. The show was already filmed. To that point, right. what they really did was the the produce like STX, which which that which was the production company that produced the show, which that guy at, at Grand Street Media was partners with. Also, he wasn't only partners with Warner; he was partners with STX. So that's the front business. You know, it was it was like no different than like the mob. They had a front business and a back. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 they had. So with the yeah, I feel like the average American misses that. But no, 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 they don't. They don't understand. And they think. And right now, people are like, "Why would Warner not pay these guys? You know, a few hundred thousand? Like they wouldn't do that." Yes, they it, would. Because you know what? The truth of the matter is, they made millions off of me. Right, right. And they, you and I think, well, I don't understand. Like, if I'm going to make twenty million dollars, why wouldn't I pay this guy a million? It was his show. He was that because the, the truth is, they've set up the system. So that they are able to continue to behave this way. I, I know right now I've been contacted by production companies who are going so far as to say, we're trying to get to people that have stories before those stories are actually published. And my thought is, so I can steal them before anybody else gets the opportunity to steal them. So that there's no even proof that they were published and turned into it. So before there's even you even own the intellectual property, we can steal it. Yeah. Because let's face it. If I write a story now, you say, okay, you wrote it. It's yours. Wait now to really document it and turn it into intellectual property that you own, you need to be able to publish it in your name. Even if it's on a website on the internet, that's still just like publishing it in, you know, Esquire magazine or GQ. Now it, it's published. There's a, there's a, a date stamp with my name attached to it. I own it. And then if you want to go a step further, you can say, I'm also going to have place it. I'm going to put a copyright on it. Right. You don't even need the copyright really, but because that really is your copyright when it's published, yep. but still now they're, they're going out and I get contacted all the time. What they're doing is they're going to places like, like concrete mm -hmm. 
and Valuetainment and Vlad, and they go and they'll watch those to try and find somebody telling their story. Because just telling your story yeah. isn't isn't intellectual property. So then they go to that guy and they go, hey, the recording is right, but you didn't make it. I, I didn't like, own it. it. No, in your I get it. I, I understand. I'm just saying for the average guy. No, right, 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 right. Like, so, not, like you own this right now. Right, right. Yeah. Tech. I mean, yeah, I own the, this, but I don't, you know, I'd have to write it up and it, it would be. Yeah. No, but, would, but essentially you own the, well, the audio is, the audio is copyrightable. Okay. So it, here's, here's what, what's happening is it's funny too, because do you know how many people that there's a guy that was on this show called his name was, um, his name's Jeff Turner, counterfeiter. And I, you know, after the show, I was like, bro, man, you got a great story. You got to write it down. I was trying to get him. You got to write it down. You know, um, you know, I'll publish it on my website. Like I talk to these people all the time. They're always contacting me to on, on, you know, what stuff I've got. Cause I've optioned a bunch of people's stuff. And I talk to production companies. They're always contacting me because of the show. And I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw yours in the mix. Like they may be looking for you. Well, in between that time he starts writing, he actually gets contacted by a producer who says, we want to write a script. So then he calls me. He's like, this is what they're saying. Then I go back. I go, no, no, no. You tell him you want something. You tell him you want. And so I negotiate with him to help get him a deal. That's only an option. So it's like, I'm going, I don't take anything for that. Yeah. That's your story. I want you to have your story. I didn't have to write the story. Like if I, if he said, Hey, will you help me write it? Okay. Well now I deserve something. Right. But at this point I've already got a, a you know, I'm making money off of the video a little here, a little there. I want the best for him. So, right. That's but, kind. That's but most not, people, but most, most people would be like, yo, but you got to give me production credit. Cause I helped you to produce now. Yeah. Like, I want 20% cause I made a phone call. Fuck yeah, you. bro. Exactly. So exactly. Yeah. yeah I, I, so, so you're dropping the lawsuit, dropping the lawsuit. That's such, such, such prison slang. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I'm dropping the lawsuit. No, yo. that's how I've been, that's what I've been calling it too. Listen, right. my, my family friend, that guy, Corey told me when we were out making, working on a movie I wanted to make, he said to me, I'm writing a show right now about a guy who's in prison. And while, he, and, and metaphorically, I, I, I took this as my roadmap when I, when I realized I was, I was ripped off by his friends and, and whether he said it for that intention or not, somehow it fit. But the, the, he said to me, I'm writing a story right now about a guy who's in jail and he breaks out. Nice. But rather, rather, I'm sorry, the I'm guy who's in jail and while he's in jail, he figures out how to solve everybody else's crime, but he can't solve his own. Okay. To the point that he studies every legal book in the prison and becomes a lawyer without passing the bar, but he becomes a lawyer. Yeah, jail health lawyer. Yeah. So now he goes, this guy is helping all the other criminals to do whatever, but the only way for him to get out is for him to basically break to break out. Yeah, it was the intention. Right. And, and I'm like, I'm like, is that the mentality? That's the mentality of the entertainment business. You know? Mm -hmm. If, if, if this breaking out, I, I'm very like metaphorical. Oh, okay. 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 If the whole premise is like breaking out, you know, come you can help everybody out. else, but you have to break out to yeah, yeah. Your, or break you in. Gotta break yourself out. Nobody's going to help you when the time comes. No, no. nobody's going to help you. Nobody's. I always love that video. Nobody's coming to help you. No, like, it's up to you. If you don't grab it by the, listen, I spent the last two years of my life fighting for this, for this thing. And whether it's, whether, whether Jesus wants it for me or not, it, we'll, we'll find out, you know, right. but I only want his will anyway, but, but this is the most, but I have like, I've worked so hard for this thing that like, I can't believe it at this, you know, the, the, the method and the path and like where it's come and where it's going. Um, yep. when it, it's funny when I was in, um, Let's say when I was locked up, I wrote a book for a guy named Ephraim Deveroli. Now I'll give you the short version because the long version's too long. Um, uh, long version. Yeah, people would be like, "Bro, come on, man! Like, it's not about you, cock." Well, I'm making it about me for a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah, do so, it. So uh, there's a guy named Ephraim Deveroli. I meet him. I read an article in Rolling Stone magazine called "A Dude," no, called called um, uh, "Arms and the Dudes." 
Um, and it got, it was optioned. And then I, I was in there with the guy and he was, he was one of the guys in the, in the article. So I approached him and I said, Hey, you ought to think about writing a story. Or, you know, I was working on my memoir at the time. I said, I'm writing a story about myself. You ought to think about writing a memoir. And he was like, I can't, I can't do that. I'm, you know? Okay. He said, I'm ADHD. I'm fucking, there's no way I could, I can't pay attention long enough. That's okay. I said, well, if you ever want any help, you know, I'll help you. No problem. So anyway, eventually we end up uh, connecting again and and he finds out that it's been optioned to the guys that make the hangover movies. No way. And he was like, yeah, bro, they're gonna make a movie about my life. And I was like, bro, you seem smarter than this. Like you, you understand that that article was written based on your business partner's point of view. Right. You're not getting anything because you won't write a story about yourself. If you wrote a story about yourself, you could maybe get a series. You could maybe get it turned into something. But this means your business partner is going to make the money. And it's going to be his version. I said, the truth is, the guys, I wouldn't want the guys that made the Hangover movie to make a movie about me because they'd make me look like a clown. Right. I said, those movies are, they're movies about guys that are just complete numbskulls. Like, they're going to make you look like like Jeff Spicoli from, you know, right. uh, last time I met Ridgemont High. I said, you got to go back out there and be a businessman. Like, right? He only had a few years. So he's like, when can we start? So we start and I, I write his story. Well, he's really a scumbag, right? So I, I write a story with him. I introduce him to my literary agent. They start scheming together and decide they want to write, me to write this thing as fast as possible so they can publish it so that they can get it into Warner Brothers' hands so they can sue Warner Brothers for stealing it from them. <laughs> so you can't play it like that. You got to actually. Like, wow. Like, <laughs> that's you. You know, and at this point, Warner, Warner Brothers hadn't done anything wrong. No, they didn't do anything wrong. They bought an article there. It, you know, this kid, this other kid, his business partner talked to a reporter. He published the article. Warner Brothers bought the article. They were going to make a movie. Right. When I say the, when I say Warner Brothers, they were in production with or connection with the production company that makes um, makes the hangover movies. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Todd Phillips. Mm -hmm. So, OK, you know, so anyway, they actually I write the story really, really quickly. They do publish it. By the way, at this point, they've just stopped talking to me. Like this kid left the prison with the book. Damn. And I've never been paid. I never got paid from him, right? So <laughs> next thing I know, I find out they've published the book. Okay, I'm making phone calls. You know, I talk to him every once in a while. Not him, but to the he never talks to me again. I talk to the uh the the literary agent who's working, trying to work a deal doing this and doing that, but it, it ends up he ends up getting it into the hands of a producer who does documentaries. He convinces him, Hey, I've got this manuscript. You might want to do a documentary on it. Mm -hmm. And the kid says, yeah, I'll do it. He signs an NDA. He sends it to him. And then like, he already knows this kid who's like in his twenties is the, he is the son of the vice president of Warner brothers. He already knows that. So he gets him the, that. And then, a couple weeks later, a month or so later, he's talking to him on the phone and he says, and he's like, hey, what are, you know, how are we doing? Have you shopped it around? He's like, yeah, it turns out Warner Brothers is going to go ahead and make the movie based on the article. And he goes, well, how do you know that? And he goes, oh, my dad is the vice president of Warner Brothers. And he says, I didn't know that. You should have told me that. I would have never sent you the, now you're telling me that the vice president of Warner Brothers has a manuscript written by, I can't believe, and he, and he yells at him and hangs up. But he knew it the whole time because he had told me already that the kid who he was. So now he hires a lawyer. Warner Brothers comes out with a movie a year later or so, right? Year, year and a half later. But he's got now he's got a reason to sue him. He sues him. Mm -hmm. The movie, by the way, that it came out, uh, the the article was Arms and the Dudes, but the movie was called um, was called War Dogs. Oh shit! Right. So you know who you know Jonah Hill plays. Okay. Yeah. Jonah Hill plays Ephraim Devaroli. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. I wrote his memoir. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so Devin Rowley never, you know, he's, he's suing Warner brothers. They, then I sue Devin Rowley and the literary agent for stealing my stuff and saying, I own the copyright. Like you stole it and you're using my, you're using my material to, to perpetrate a fraud. Yeah. I blow up. Listen, this kid was supposed, he would have probably made whatever, $50 million on that lawsuit. Because they really had Warner Brothers. I come in and I explain to Warner Brothers that it's a scam. I was in on it. I, I was there when they schemed it. We were in the visitation room at the prison. 
and I start having proof. I can prove this. I can prove that. So they end up settling for virtually very little money. I then sue. I then get out of prison. I sue Devaroli. Devaroli and I, we end up having to settle. In the meantime, the 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 produce. Um, sorry, the literary agent. He dies. He actually died the same day they came up with the agreement on with Warner Brothers. He dies that day. They they end up having an agreement to settle the lawsuit. He dies that night. So anyway, the point is, is that, you know, it goes both ways. But I mean, like I've been in that. And listen, Warner Brothers was vicious. It was like, why does I'm in prison? You guys could have come and given me 20 grand. I would have gone away. I cost this kid. He told me you cost me tens of millions of dollars. I was like, yeah, you could have come and give me fucking 10 or 20 grand. I would have been thrilled to get out of prison with ten thousand dollars in my pocket. Yeah. Thrilled. You got nothing to lose. It, it, that's what they don't seem to understand. That's, by that's what they don't get. As yeah. I got, see, see, everybody's everybody's coming at. That's what I, you know, when everybody told me that you 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 can't go fight this fight, you're never gonna have a career. I'm like, I got nothing to lose. They took my work already. Right. Well, I, here's I, the thing. When I have no career. Here's the thing. Look, if you make it like your, if if this ends up being your defi- the defining thing in your life, that then honestly, then they really have fucked you. But, you know, everybody thinks that like, oh, you can't, you, you need to go on and do something. No, wait a minute. Guess what? I can do both. Right. Like I can fight this and I'll continue to work. And there are so many, like 20 years so ago. Ready to roll. And I'm a free agent now. Well, I was going to say 20 years ago, they could shut you down because there was only three big production companies and they worked kind of in conjunction. Oh, oh, this There's guy left this. Still is, it still is three. It still is three publishers. Well, I understand, but there's lots of little, there's lots of little in between independent pr- production oh, yeah. companies. So Netflix isn't one of those three. You okay. know what I'm saying? Like Hulu isn't like Apple is not like there's tons of little ones that work with smaller production yeah. companies. So you That's can all still- the distribution stuff, but like the producing stuff, look at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a, pro- I know how to produce, but I write my, I can write my own stuff and I can direct my own stuff. Right. The, the but like producing is just putting all the pieces together, right? And and like yes. most people have the ability to produce. You have an iPhone, you go pick up one of these body mics that you know I'm wearing, and yeah. like all of a sudden you're you're you can you can put the pieces together to make this thing. Yeah. Oh listen, anybody can make a documentary, anybody can make anybody. but but I mean look, the the right now the the production value of uh, uh, you can get cameras you can rent the cameras you can get right, the cam- everything right so the only thing then is like do you have a some recognizable actors um do you have listen or, there's lots or you have but, enough or you have enough that it just picks that that it goes viral i i was gonna say or you you have a strong enough story that it runs with the story and it, it does it pick and there's there's tons of movies that you didn't have anybody in them like oh, there, there was nobody and they end up blowing up and they made them for 40 or fifty thousand dollars and they end up being those are the ones that make you know blair watch project you know what was it? exactly like you're gonna make this for fifty thousand dollars and it makes yeah. brings in millions and millions of dollars Fire King brought in 309 million dollars and they've shot half that shit on a on a on a camcorder in the moment yeah, but that guy knew what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> like, he, was, like, he was pretty good, you know. Um, yeah, no, for I, sure. And, you know, or maybe you come up with something like, um, did you do you know what the Blair Wetch project was? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of so that was th- th- this sort of thing has been my mentality. Is that's what I was going to turn this into is the documentary about how it works and like, and this is the heart of what I've been trying to get to with you. And I always get on a tangent because I care about like the what in my mind is the art of how I was going to make this thing and how it got botched. Right but is the fact that the industry is designed to do this and the way it's designed to do this is so simple, but nobody, no, nobody can follow it. And the, and the premise is that all these production companies are 1099 independent contractors and they utilize this 1099 independent contractor structure as the insulate the bill. Yeah, because yeah. now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sue GFY Productions, right? Which is probably worthless. Maybe it's got 20 grand in it. Right. Which is what they allocated to like what would be a first time union wage. 
So I didn't want to be a union worker, but they're using the 1099 structure to be a union worker. So you sue this little nothing company, you take everything. And it's like basically what they want, what Warner wanted to pay for the idea. No. It's and no they get Walt Disney. Walt Disney stole all the land for the park. I don't know if you know that story. Uh, no, I, I know that he bought the ton of the land using various entities. So nobody really knew what was happening until it was too late. Exactly. And that's and that's what these guys did with my work. Right. I didn't know what was happening. They teased me. They mocked me. There's all you know, if I just put all the mocking together, it's it's its own, you know, video. Yeah, but that that may be a little documentary, a one hour documentary. That's what Listen, there's it's a series like Tiger King. There's there's 10 episodes and whatever else. And, you know, I, I already copywrote it, so I'm good. And, you know, but the whole thing and it's going to get published in the courts now. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I, I'm just trying to. I can't stop them. Right. You, you and I can't stop them. But what we can do is we can bring recognition to it and we can say, look, it, it, this is a structure. That, this is the structure that their attorneys created for them, because the attorneys are, are probably some of the biggest cor corrupt other than the politicians. I mean, we don't even have to go down that path. But but like, you know, the the attorneys more than likely establish this structure for them. So that they can go out and call call the concepts parallel ideas, which yeah. is what they constantly told me. You know, you have you're you, uh, we liked what you were saying, but it was really just kind of a parallel idea to the network. But but you know, yeah, to to another idea that we've already been working on, or that yeah. or, or or oh yeah, that's interesting. You know, I've heard that thrown around before. They throw that might throw that out there, and then yeah. they've already got another production company ready to go to say, hey. Make We're this. gonna go ahead and run with this on this production company, and then that way, if they you ever subpoena those people, they say, "Well, we've been working on that for months." Like that's a it was just a pair two two of the same very similar they might ideas. At the same time, it's just yeah. a coincidence. It's a huge coincidence, but yeah. And then you know, and then you know what that does. You know why they do that? It skirts the NDA. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. So now you've skirted the NDA, and you've said that that was like that's like not valuable. Yeah. Then all these 1099 structures, which are set up in case you could beat that NDA charge, like now you have these 1099 structures in place, like in a, in a circle where they just pass the shit around. Right. Well, it's like Gawker Media getting sued. They just closed down. Yep. Like fine. Never get we'll just do another production company right there. <laughs> you're never getting your 110, no. your $110 million. Like we'll just close. Close the whole. We'll claim bankruptcy and we'll close the whole thing down, and you're, yeah, you'll be lucky to get mm -hmm. get a few. If you even if you get, if you might not even get a million or two. No. So and then that that same staff of people go over here and they start another company. Same group, same everybody, and that's all they do is they just they just hop around. Look, I learned I learned in finance how this works because I you know I, I in in the brokerage business in in uh, my dad's in the brokerage business for the 30 years and right. and uh equity derivative brokerage and and there was there was these big players and the, these they call them idbs the inner dealer brokers they're, right. they're they're no different than than uh like like a facilitation desk at a bank but they're independents so they right. they, they they connect all the cu customers these idbs use 1099s basically for legal slavery so the way that they do it is they'll you want if you're a broker and you have you know a track record of 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 producing you know a million two million three million in commissions a year, they'll front you like five hundred grand in a ten ninety nine, as a debt forgiveness. Then what they do is this is all perfectly legal, but then what they do is you now go work for them and they paid you five hundred grand up front and you gross a million bucks for the year. You have to pay. You had to pay two fifty in taxes on that, and now they pay you a little bit of a difference, and you use that to go pay your taxes now at the end of the year. Because nine nine out of ten guys were street guys who didn't know any better. Like I got five hundred grand in cash in my bank account, and they spent right. it. So now you're in you're in debt to that company, but and they'll give you another ten ninety nine the next year, and hopefully you learn better. But more than likely, you need that next five hundred grand to pay the taxes on the last five hundred grand. Right. Because you probably broke even, and then they keep this 
they keep this train going. So when I realized that my attorney told me what these guys were doing, and I saw that it was this 1099 thing, I saw that they were playing with the same 1099 structure that I had just come from in, in finance. So I was like, huh, they just pass it off. Instead of using the 10, you know, they just pass it from 1099 to 1099. It's hot potato. Okay. And they're all independent of, of the network. You know, the network, because all the network has to say is, we didn't facilitate that. Right. That wasn't, we're really sorry you, you, you dealt with a production company like that. Yeah. Yeah, we had no idea. We just bought the product from the production company. And keep in mind, too, you signed something and they signed, everybody signed something saying that, We'll, we'll, um, you know, we'll make you whole or we'll, um, what is the term where you, you, you say we'll, um, indemnify you. They'll, we'll indemnify you from any lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So they have to product, pro, they have to protect you or, or say, um, accept liability on your behalf because I'm telling you, I own this product. I haven't stolen it. Here it's yours. And if anybody comes after you, I'll indemnify you. So yeah, yeah. they'll sue me and I'll represent you. And the truth is, you know, Sony in the, from the very beginning probably already knew something was wrong or Warner or whoever yeah. the production company. Yeah, they is. all they all knew. And, and the reason I can prove that now, which is why I'm fighting this, is because I got the lawyer on tape. Right. Um so funny man I, I i ended up with a lawyer too that was just uh, you know i i called and called the same thing i called and called and called couldn't find anybody finally got a guy got a complete maniac lawyer and i was like this is insane but he was he was great he was great but yeah he was a maniac he's like yeah i, I was <laughs> like guys who were like not afraid of the you know i was like this is this is the best i could do but you know but also it wasn't the best it was like but you need the guy was also a maniac he'd sued all these huge companies he got all these massive lawsuits like in the end i realized like wow i'm super lucky to even have to have this lawyer and not only that i got a great lawyer like i got a better lawyer than if i had given him 100 grand no i got the same thing i got the same thing my my this guy this guy that's representing me i mean you know, he's represented Rick Ross he, or, or, or gone up against him one or the other. And he, he beat the New York Yankees, which is like definitely a feat. Right. Not after Soros. You know, he's not afraid. Oh, listen, when when, when I finally when we finally settled the lawsuit, he was like, OK, what do you, how do you want to do? I said, bro, you can take it all. <laughs> and he was like, what? Because I realized he's been fly, he's flown to Miami. They, yeah. He and his partner, they flew me up here. They've done deposition. They've done it's like, yeah, look, bro. Like, I already know you're in the hole. He's, I am in the hole. <laughs> I was like, he's like, I'm not going to take the whole thing. though. He said, that's, I'm like, I said, no, but I get it. If you did, no, no, you know, but I, I was just at that point, I was like, I was, I just wanted to make sure I took as much as I could from Devaroli. Yeah. Because at that point I was living in someone's spare room. You know, I'd gotten out of prison. We're, with, we're dealing with those guys. That's so crazy. I love that. That was one of the movies throughout this thing that I was like, that's how this all works. Oh, yeah. oh, listen, if you knew, it's funny, too, because Devaroli, like, you can't buy his book. Like, he, I think he's trying to sell them for, like, a hundred bucks a piece or something, the hard copies or something. Like, he doesn't even want it out there. But the the real story is so, the real, real story, not War Dogs, because, by the way, War Dogs is just complete fiction. Well, yeah. not complete, but 80% of it's just fiction. The real story is over-the-top amazing. It, you can't believe it. Yeah. I would um, love that. I yeah, and that's that's the movie that should have been made. Yeah. That's the, that would have been a series. This kid's life, he and Pacquiao's, they, that their lives are an absolute series. Yeah, because they're just crazy, right? They just like it's a couple of young guys who got a little too much money and like. Well, no, it's it's not that. It's it's that you're you're 19 years old, and you're bidding against, you know, Lockheed Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're. You're up against the, and, and you're you're coming in under bid. You don't really know even know how you're going to pull this off. You're leveraging millions of dollars. You're 19, and you're leveraging millions of dollars. Like, okay, we have to have two million dollars to do this. It's like you're 19 or 20 years old. How, how how do you even deal with that? And this is a guy that when he started off, he's living it. He's basically living in someone's spare room. He's driving a 10 year old beat to shit Mercedes. 
Now, he very and once he started making money, he ends up getting a nicer place, a nicer vehicle, but still nothing crazy. Yeah, Not like in the movie. The right? What? I think they were down in the continuum. They were living. Or at um, least in the movie they had them in the continuum. It's a building, building in, in South Beach. Yeah, he was living in something called like the Flamingo something. It was a huge, it, there was two different buildings. There's an old building, then there's a new one, which is a huge high rise. But yeah. like in, in the movie, he's driving like they're driving Porsches, but okay. none of that, yeah. none of that happens. Wasn't the case. Yeah. No. Like, of you know, in, in the movie, remember the, do you remember in the movie, like the guy takes the gun and sticks it to Pacow's head and he's going to kill him. And like, that never happened. Remember they bring him money at the end of the movie. That never, like so there's yeah. Yeah. 80 to 90, 90 percent of that movie just, just didn't happen. But that character was a real character. No, I'd say both the characters were, it was definitely, they, they were, that's exactly how they both are. The, uh, the terrorist. Yeah, that's a guy, they change his name in the movie. His real name is Tomei. It's like, um, shit, I forget his first name. It's something Tomei. He's really, he's on, and it, that's exactly true. He's on the terrorist watch list. Same. Like, the, he can't come to the United States. He's, he's, um, he's a serious guy. Like, he really is a, um, like a, a Victor Bot. Like, the, that's the guy who the Lord of War is yeah, based yeah. off. He really is a Victor Bot. Like it's, it's, and he's Swedish. It's from yeah, he's a Swede. Oh wow! Speaks German. Um, you know, sells to anybody, and they end up. Deveroli ends up hooking up with him. Uh, but but I mean, look, like the deals we're, we're talking about, Deveroli, who's at this point, I think about, I think he's like twenty one or twenty two. No, he's he's twenty one. He's flying into you, you, oh, so, former Soviet bloc countries in Europe. And they're walking them onto the military bases, and he's walking through these massive bunkers of weapons, going, "Uh, okay, these I'll I'll take ten thousand AK forty sevens. Are those sniper? Are, are are those are those Dragovs? Yeah, okay, I need five thousand of those. Um, and then they start arguing. They're like, okay, we this uh a hundred and fifty dollars. I'm not paying hundred and fifty dollars. That's not going to happen. And he starts arguing and yelling and screaming. And then he would go and get on the phone. I'll, let me call my boss. Let me see what I can do. He is the boss. <laughs> That's the yeah. He calls his girlfriend. Hey, what are you doing? Nah, I'm here. I'm 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 in fucking Lithuania. Yeah, yeah. I don't know the guy. I'm, he thinks I'm talking to my boss. So what are you doing? Talks to him for twenty minutes. Comes back and says two point seven million. We won't do another a dollar more. That's it. I mean, they go back and you're arguing, <laughs> with, you're arguing with generals that haven't been paid in six months. Yeah. So. That's yeah, and then, then he's got to get them on planes. They have to fly the planes in. He's getting ripped off left and right. That whole, that whole uh, the whole uh, part of about repacking the ammo was real. That's how he got met. Those are really yeah. He repackaged all the ammo. The ammo had been donated by China to Al. Uh, is it Albania? Um, and. And he knew it was Chinese, and he he shipped it anyway. He'd actually already shipped four or five million rounds before he realized, and the army had accepted it. Yeah, that's crazy. Right. So, which was fine. I mean, I mean, it's not fine. They, the army doesn't know if it's okay or not. They just know, hey, we, we're looking. We need AK forty seven rounds. Give me. Okay, you got some. Great. They're not checking. Hey, well, I think to, think that there's an embargo. On, they don't give a shit. Yeah. So what ends up? But Dude, then. Pacals realizes, hey, there's an issue. And he mentions it. And Devaroli could have said, no, it's fine. Let's just keep going. Instead, he call, he contacts the military and asks them about, about it. And they say, no, you, we, you can't ship that. Had he never asked, there never would have been a problem. Wow. Because he asked and was told no and continued to do it, he created a conspiracy. They said you conspired to defraud us. That's really it. Like the, the New York Times came out with an article that said it was all old and corrosive, but the truth is none of it was corrosive. Like none of it was bad. It all worked. And um, you know, they were just upset because you've got these massive companies that are being underbid by these these young kids, stoner kids. The truth of the matter is, is it's just like in that in the movie, like the, the linchpin of the whole thing is like somebody. There's always, you know, my conspiracy belief about the whole about life is that there's like some evil, do, evil doer all the way atop all, all the money and power and control. And they're doing 
and we're all just slaves to like the banking system sort of a thing where somebody wanted to fund that transaction. Right. You know, yeah, they listen, made I just want to get on. I just want to get on the, the merry-go-round. Right. Yeah. I just want to be a part of it. I'm sorry. I don't want to <laughs> I want to be on. I just throw me, let me get on so I can get my, Send me I, I just want to be able to, I just want my stories to get out there. Yeah, no, exactly. But that's, yeah. but like, that's being an artist. I think, I think that's yeah. totally different. No, I don't want to screw anybody over. No, I just I want to be, so, you know, I want to be... expose the truth. Yeah. That's a dangerous game though. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh yeah. Listen, like your, your whole, you're saying, you know, your whole, Christianity thing, right? You, you understand that I had a deal with a production company that stopped dealing with me. Part of it was, you know, because they started talking about just America and just like some, what is too long of a story, but one of the inch sound engineers while we were recording ends up making a crack about how the whole system's rigged by old white men, or something. And I went, Okay. And I just kept going. And then she said something else. And then I, I, then they were like, what do you think about that? And I said, well, I mean, I, I get what you're going, you're going for here. I said, you know, there are like, there's no perfect system. Right. And there I said, perfect. and I said, you know, so, and they, what do you mean? I said, well, look, it's like this. I said, it's like, I said, it's a difficult concept. I said, do you know what is a beautiful concept? And they go, what? I said, communism. Everybody works together. They work for the betterment of society. They all share in the in the spoils. It's a wonderful, wonderful concept that we all grow together. I said, but it doesn't work. It's never worked in any fashion. It's been tried for the last hundred years, and it's a complete failure every single time. I said, so we need to put that aside. I said, you know what is a horrible concept? The idea of capitalism. Individuals work off of the labor of other people, and, and they use their their they use capital to get higher and higher. I said, but you know what ends up happening as a result of that? It raises everybody up. I said, now, I said, so if you work hard, if you're smart and you work hard, you do better. I said, than, than other people. I said, I said, but it's a difficult concept. So people hate it. And I said, so I said, it's kind of like I feel about church. I said, I go to church. I don't believe 100% of everything that's in the Bible, but I know that when I go and I listen to the preacher talk, I walk out of there and I take what I can from what he said that I believe in. And I always feel better because it's reaffirming for life and for just being a decent human. And I said, so I'm okay with that. I don't have to believe every single thing. And, and I said, you know, I said, so I said, that's just how I feel. So there, and there were some other arguments involved, right? She brings up Andrew Tate. She brings up some other things that I end up saying, eh, the problem with Andrew Tate is I said, I don't believe in everything he believes in, but I do believe in working hard, get off your ass, work hard, work out, be a good person, work hard and, and make things happen for yourself. You know, now, I don't believe all the other things, be promiscuous, have as many girlfriends as you want. Like, I don't believe that. I don't, you know, but whatever. I, can't, I don't have to believe everything. Well, right. because I said we that. We our journey. Right. Listen, within three days, my can my contract is canceled. They don't want to work with me. They said, we don't share the same values. Wow. Now they were in California. I'm in Florida. So it was like, like, I don't know what the owners of public supermarket, what their values are. I still go there to get food. Like, it's like, what are you doing? That's like, you, yeah. And, and, but so when you with the with wearing the cross and, and some of the things that you've said, like that's already an issue for people in California. Oh, you know it. It's a it's a huge issue for them. They're like, you know, it's like, like I don't. I wouldn't be sitting here telling my story today if I didn't believe that Jesus was Lord. Right. I, I mean, I, I listen. I get it. You but know? the problem is, is that they in oh, they're their gonna come in a frenzy. Huh? They're gonna come after. They're gonna come after. They're gonna try and silence me for that. Right. And that's what I don't understand. Like, well, what? To me, that's prejudice. I know. Like if, they, if you're, they're fighting against prejudice, you're now, they're now prejudiced. You're exactly. saying that because I'm Christian, you dislike me? You don't want to do anything to do with me? You, you think you, you're validating, screwing me over because I believe in God or I believe in Jesus or I believe in the, the I believe the, in the Bible? Like, it only, really, it only sorry, proves further, it only proves further that it's all real because, you know, if, if, 
if they're then they're 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 worshiping the beast. Hey, I have a question. Have you ever you, you ever listened to Jordan Peterson? I really don't know. I don't. I really don't. Serious? Can I tell? I, I, here and there, I've listened to it, but I got to tell you the the truth of the whole thing is when this all went down, and I realized that all media is just a lie. I stopped consuming all of it. Cold turkey. No, listen. You have to. Jordan Peterson breaks down um, Bible stories, and he's like, "Look, put aside relig the religious aspect. Let's break." And he's like, "You have to treat it. It's not religion. It's a relationship." Well, listen, he breaks down the stories and he just understands, he just explains that the stories themselves are just about good and evil. Yeah, it's just sure. about triumph. It's just about, so he starts explaining them in such a way that it is so validating. And he's like, look, you don't, let's put away, let's put God aside. If you, if you don't want to believe in, follow the Bible because of God, then follow it. Then let's just listen to what the basic of the story is. And he explains it in such a great way. You're like, wow, at the end of it, it's so life affirming. And you're like, like, it just makes you think, you know what? In the end, you just, you need to be a decent person. Yeah. Like, it's great. Just you really should try. do it. All you have to do is try. Right. That's it. Just try. Just try. Try and spread the gospel. Just try to do your best. When you know, you got to try when you know, right? Because like, look, as, as, we all we all have that inherent wanting to like I could just do that, you know. Yeah. All like no, I could, I could do that and get away with it, and no one will know. But it's when you stop. I fully, full heartedly believe it's when you stop and you say, "I know I could, but I'm not gonna." Right. You know that 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 because like there's something more than all of this. Well, I tell you, those people in Hollywood better hope not. <laughs> well, uh, they are. Yeah. They sold out, bro. They, you know, I just don't look, listen, you know, what's so funny is like when I had a ton of money, mm -hmm. when I had tons of money and I was, you know, was just, you know, whatever ball and could get whatever I want. Miserable. 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 That is my point. I listen, yeah. I, 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 I don't even want to go to this element because I don't want to sell myself like this, but I grew up around a lot of people with a lot of money. Yeah. My dad worked for a multi, my dad worked for a multi-billionaire. So like, you know, this was, I was like the entry level of that society, you know, of, of, but like, but, but we were, we, you know, my, my dad is not that well, like not my dad's well off, but he's not like those guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, th those guys make, those guys have so much money they could buy you, you know? Yeah. And, and I grew up with a lot of friends in that, that grew up like that. You know, I went to school with people who were like, not Rothschilds, but like maybe were, you know, or like, right. or like they were founders of America and all these sorts of things. And I'm like, all these kids, it's like my portfolio, my trust fund, my this, my that. I remember coming home and asking my parents, was it a trust fund? And them being like, don't worry about it. And yeah. I was like, well, I guess <laughs> I don't know. ever have to worry about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, well, what are these kids talking about? You know, <laughs> but, but that was like, I, but, but the more and more you look around, like nobody's happy. And, yeah. and what it proves is like, no matter how much money you have, you can't buy that. You, you, you can. And, and that's what I found in the gospel. Do you really need to the, the Jordan Peterson thing? Cause he talks about it all the time. He talks about sitting in your, your Toyota and some guy drives by in a Lamborghini and you think, God, wow, I, I, I could be, I want to be that guy. And he's like, do you want to be that guy? Do you, do you have any you idea? Do you be that guy? Huh? Yeah, or you have I mean, no, oh, I absolutely. But he also says, look, he's like, the thing is, I counsel those guys. That guy's married to a woman that despises him. His children don't like him. He works 80 hours a week. He's got a bunch of money. He thinks money means everything. He, he starts breaking it down. That guy thinks about committing suicide once or twice a week. Yeah. And he's miserable. So, you know, look, you don't know what, what he had I to do know. to get it to get there. I know people in that circle and, and it's, it's, it, listen, my, the mentor I told you about the first mentor I told you, my mentor who taught me business was, is one of the, <clears throat> he was one of the largest pork dealers, pork, pork purveyors in all of America. You've eaten his pork. He supplies right. Boar's Head, Stop and Shop, Walmart, uh, BJ's Pro Costco Price Club. I you love it. it. It's his pork. Right. Yeah. We all eat his pork if you yeah. eat pork. So this man was one of the, 
you know, the most successful business owner I know, knew personally. And the only difference, and, and, and uh, somebody I do know that is a billionaire told me the only difference between a, a, a medium-sized business owner and a large business owner is the amount of money they started with. And this guy started a medium-sized business with $500. So, you know, for those for those that don't know what a medium-sized business is, that's something that grosses over $100 million a year. Small businesses below 20. So this guy started this business on 500 bucks from his dad's sausage. He had a sausage business and they turned it into, he turned it into the largest pork distribution. He had so much money and I loved him to death, but he was depressed and he took, yeah. and he took his own life. And that, in that people wouldn't believe that because, no. because he had, poor jet, people... he had six cars and he had a house on the beach and he had a, a house in Florida and he used, you know, well, because people have to believe that the reason they're unhappy is because they don't have enough money. The problem is they get that money and they're still unhappy. And you know what they do? They want to kill themselves. Or they think, well, if I got that company, well, if I did this, well, if I got a new wife, what I got at some point you get all that and you realize that's not what that's not it. But typically by then your life's your ego. Ego. you gotta you gotta you gotta destroy your ego and you gotta build your way back up from from there. It's funny. I always say that like I was the happiest yeah. when I got out of prison and I was just so humble and so appreciative. And so that true. was when I was really the happiest. So you know, you were forced to rebuild. Yeah. Uh, listen, I was forced to rebuild. I, I this whole show started for me as a I was already in my own. I was depressed and I went and yeah. I got myself help. I went to therapy. You know, it was coming off my mentor hurting, hurting himself. But, but, uh, but I had, but I had, um, I, I was in a dark place, and and this show was born out of a, a idea one day that I was like, if I had my whole dream of a fantasy of a life, like what would it be? It would be this reality show, and it came from journaling, you know, but it was. The thing I learned really fast was, and I knew, and I knew I was depressed about it. Cause I said, when I, when I got into asking for help and going to therapy and it was like, build me with no ego. That's, I remember going to my, one of my first sessions with my therapist. I said, rebuild me with no ego. I'm torn down now. We need to go from the ground up and I want to not care about stuff. What car I drive, how much you have, what kind of house you look, none of it matters. Right. It matters. Your relationships with people matter. Yeah. Uh, oh, hey, listen, I, there's so much. Right? Anyway. Um, yeah. You want to yeah. go two hours? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Listen, I have no, listen, the, I, honestly, I, I, I was telling your uh, assistant that, um, yeah, he, he was like, you know, I said, well, how long does this take? And the, how long do you feel like you need? And he's like, ah, he could probably do it in 20 minutes. If he talks about this it might be another 10 minutes. You know, might be 40, 40, but at most 40, 45 minutes. Then he's unless he goes on a tangent, I go, well, let's get him on some tangents. I said, I'm happy with between an hour to two hours. I said, I'm happy with that. If it goes over, it's even a bonus. Then I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm tangent. I can go on tangents. Every one of those production meetings was supposed to be 30 minutes. And I did two hours because I was looping and pulling the little details. But like, you know, listen, at the end of the day, like it comes down you know, from human to human, like that's all that this is about. It's about like, we all don't, my joke, my joke always was like growing up, like what's even going on right now? <laughs> right, right. Listen, my, uh, so, you know, I'm, we're working with a production company that for, to build this or to, to do this one video or this one uh, documentary. And I, I actually working on with three different production companies, but so, but this one's further ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a little, and I and and then I was talking. So I'm always we're always kind of joking back and forth, like, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? And I said, you know what's the worst part of this is? And he goes, What? I said, is that someday this will probably happen, and there will actually be we'll actually be in a theater and we'll watch the film for the first time, the documentary, and it'll be two hours. And I said, out of all the things that we did and how much we've laughed about it and joked about it and had fun talking about it, you'll watch the film and you're going to go, eh, it was all right. I know. So part, you know, to me, like I told my, my wife this, it's the fun is 
the meetings, the daydreaming, the talking. Like I had yeah. more fun with my buddies in prison, walking around laughing about stuff than the finished product. None of it matters. It's because you know why? It's the it's the child in you. It's the being. It's the it's the kid. It's the like. It's that part of you, that, that innocent part of you that like somehow still exists, even though we've been beaten and battered by like guys who created a 1099 structure, bend me over and stick it as far up as they could, you know, <laughs> like that. Have you, you know what I, I was going to say? It's, it's, it's really, it's popcorn because have you ever, popcorn smells way better than it tastes. <laughs> I love when you smell the popcorn. It's like, this is great. And then you eat the bomb. You're like, if there's a butter on it. You put yeah. a bit more, more salt. No, it's too salty now. You put, it's like, it's never as good as it. That's the whole thing. It's the whole journey of getting there. When you get there, you're like. See, and that was the whole, for me, listen, that was, it's funny because that's why I recorded the whole thing as the, the, the development meetings, because I wanted to, that's why I know I had Jesus on my side too, because I recorded who thinks to record all the meetings. I thought I was recording all the meetings because that was going to be the gold. The like right. the making it was going to be the like I guess look I'm excited now about it like that's like what like you want to see like it was it was like when I was a kid the greatest my favorite part of any movie was the outtakes yeah the end, remember they don't even do that anymore yeah yeah I I was telling so the one of the the producer that it was he's a producer and the the uh, director I was telling him I said you know what would be great is that when we're doing this whole thing I start filming the back like the I want to film. Scenes. Yeah, I want to film. Well, I don't want to film what they're doing, and I want to film the people they're interviewing, or, or I'm sorry, that, that you know, on other than the interview, mm -hmm. you know, like who, who are you? Who? The, and I said, then you end up with a 30 minute or an hour documentary about the making of the making the of the thing. I know that was my, yeah. that was what started me off as a filmmaker. So, um, you know, and it, to me, I was like, I'd be, it, it would be jumbled, and you know, but I mean, I, I can mic somebody up. I can set up a camera. I mean, this is yeah, the web okay. camera, but. You know, yeah. it's not that hard nowadays with the equipment. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. The iPhone's incredible. I filmed, I filmed this thing, the press release for the news that we're going to run on my phone with the three lights I got set up here now and a, and a body mic. And like, you'd think that I shot it on a, on an Ari. Do you, do you want, do you want us to run that? Um, the news promo? Yeah. Potentially. I mean, I think they were using it to shop, but yeah, we could. Oh, well, it's up to you. Uploading it is a, uploading. It's a bitch. Why? I got bad Wi-Fi. Yep. <laughs> Yo, what up? I'm Jack Pugy, Flip Productions. I did a thing this morning. I filed a lawsuit against HBO because I believe they stole the concepts for a show I created called Insta Famous and turned it into two shows on their network, Fake Famous and F Boy Island. Maybe you saw these shows, maybe you didn't, but you've probably watched hundreds of shows just like it. Ones that were stolen from the person who created it. And not just HBO, but on any of the major networks. There was even a movie based on the concept of stealing concepts. Big Fat Liar, about a teenage boy whose creative writing assignment was stolen by a Hollywood producer. I learned for myself, though, how the whole system worked in 2021 when I brought my concepts to a friend in the industry who introduced me to another guy who passed me off to a production company that supposedly specialized in turning concepts into reality shows. What I didn't know was they all worked for HBO. And not directly, but through an intricate and clever system built by HBO's lawyers that relies on a network of independent contractors who are trained to find the best concepts and pass them along to the network. Then as the independent studio works with the creator, the information continues to get funneled back through the chain up to the network and added to the show already in production. Then, in my case, before the creator even got to pitch the show, I was mocked with it and learned that there was already a similar show lined up and I was encouraged to go back to the drawing board. Someone had a parallel idea was the legal and deceptive unprovable term used to describe the ongoing supposed coincidence that more than one person can have the same idea at roughly the same time. And so 
the network can't be accused of theft. Well, I have proof that it's not just a coincidence. I have more than 20 hours of audio, video, recorded evidence that's admissible in court that proves without and beyond reasonable doubt that Fake Famous and F-Boy Island were stolen from me. Because my concept was meant to be a documentary about how someone becomes famous, I began recording all of my development meetings with GFY and Grand Street Media, as well as my attorneys, who simultaneously represented HBO, by the way. Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I represent HBO. What they revealed in these calls is nothing short of living proof that the system is designed for theft. Dave Chappelle called it a game of three card Monty that the industry plays time and time again. And they do it to steal and collect show concepts. I had even suggested some cast members for the show I was pitching. And one of them, Garrett Morosky, was cast to be the star of F Boy Island. What's up? What's up, brother? I just won your TV show. Garrett later admitted to me that a producer at GFY was the person who cast him to be on the show, which he ended up winning. I realize this is a classic Jack versus the Giant story, but I'm up to a challenge. While this is far from the first time someone has come forward claiming theft of an original work by the networks, it is the first time someone's presented the argument that the independent 1099 contractors have been used as a clever way for studios to keep themselves insulated from anyone successfully suing them for theft of intellectual property. Others before me have tried to take on these entertainment behemoths, but they're always shut down in the, oh yeah, prove it, phase of the fight. And without the solid evidence that a concept's been stolen, all those creators, producers, writers, directors before me were rowing upstream without a paddle. And with my evidence, I'm not only fighting for me, but I'm fighting on behalf of the truth. I have an outboard engine, and I'm not gonna stop until the truth's revealed and the big fat liars are taken to task. The bullies of this industry have had their day, and today belongs to the little guys, the creators whose ideas, until now, are, have routinely been snatched away with little recourse, more than hush money if they got lucky. But this little producer's soul is not for sale. I have the worst Wi-Fi on earth. And it rained yesterday here. So like you guys had the monsoon all weekend we had. Um where are you? New York. Yeah, where I'm I well no, there was there was a there was a storm. I forget. I brought my 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 wife, she checks all she checks the weather every day. Like she's got some weather issue. I'm like, I I barely ever leave the house. Like yeah. I go to the gym in the morning, I come back, and then she comes home later that day and tells me if it was hot or cold or if it rained. <laughs> You say so. Yeah, we had we had the craziest rain all weekend. So like it because it rained, like the Wi-Fi is even like slower. It'll take like three days to dry out. <laughs> well, this won't be up for, you know, Colby won't do this for it'll be over a week before this right. comes out. So if you do want to, you know, like yeah, you can, it might already it might have already come out, sort of thing by that point. But yeah, well that's fine. We can still run it. Listen, yeah, I mean, listen. All the publicity I can get. That's kind of my objective here. Is like I. You know, like my key points are like this, the business is built to steal. Um, I mean, granted, we just did it all. So. So how, um, so how many other platforms are you going on? I don't know what the plan is right now. I, I just, mean, those, guys, those guys are running, those guys are running it. The guys that you spoke with, Jesse and Brian, I don't know who, I don't know who's, if you spoke with Jesse or Brian, but. I don't know. I didn't speak to anybody. I, I, my, my, uh, my booking agent told me. Gotcha. Um, but but if you guys need some more uh, people, yeah, I want to go on everybody I possibly can. I would love to go on Danny. Yeah. I, I I've been I've been I've been. I don't I've even get return Danny. return phone calls from Danny. Yeah, I've I've been following Danny since he did Ben Mala's show. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, I was like, and like I hate to smack talk Ben's show, but like when Danny did Ben's show, it was amazing. Yeah. And then they all disappeared. So I can't even like when I tell people about it, I'm like, I can't show you the old concrete ones. Uh, well, Ben got them from Danny and he's upload. I think he uploaded them on his. Oh, he does. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's uploaded all of them or he puts them out periodically or something. It's like th- like two or three hundred of them. Yeah, I know. I mean, the like Danny's is an amazing editor. Yeah, he's he's got a. It, the funny thing about him is he has a sarcastic side yeah. to him, and it comes across. You can see it in the editing. Yeah, yeah. It's his. It's his because like with the way he would deliver Ben. Oh my gosh! I mean, <laughs> Ben is like one of the funniest characters ever to exist to me. Yeah, Ben. The problem is, Danny sees Ben how he is, and the guys that are running it for him now are guys that that edit Ben the way Ben sees how he is, and that's yeah. not like that's not good. right. You wouldn't want it, me to edit my. No, I was gonna say you wouldn't want me to edit me because I'd only be the cool guy. Yeah, somebody I know. else edits it and lets lets people know he's kind of a douchebag. Yeah. You know? you- like, I know you have to show it. It's like it. You just have to show. It's like it's like any good director. They show both faces, like from you know, like they give you this side and that side, sort of thing. When they're when they're telling a story, and it, we wouldn't do it of ourselves because we want we all want to be like, look, this is mine. No, if we didn't have that grandiose narcissism that we all have somewhere, no. <laughs> like you just don't see yourself how you are. You just don't like. And I, I always say, like you know, look, it, the problem is, is that if. You know, if 20 people say you're an asshole, then you're probably an asshole. Like, you, you don't believe it. Yeah. You're, you can't see it. No. no but you... if, but they're not lying, bro. 20 people didn't get together, call you an asshole because you're really just this wonderful human being. You've probably got some asshole in you. Yeah, no, you're so. coming across that way. I know. Listen, that was um, why I went to, that was therapy for me. <laughs> Enough people told me. But I have people that, um, will see me on the street and recognize me, right? So they'll come up, they'll be like, oh my God, bro, you're the guy from, or hey, you're Matt Cox or whatever. And they'll shake my hand and they get, oh my God, can I get a picture? Can I, can I do it? And, you know, I always think to myself, like, you you saw me on, like, you don't realize, they don't know that I'm an asshole. Like, you guys think, like, you don't realize that I, like, I know you know I got out of prison. But you, you know, and they think like, oh, you're doing great. You're amazing. Like, you don't realize I barely make my bills every month. You know, you don't realize I drive a piece of garbage car. You don't realize, you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't see those little things. And sometimes my my wife will be there and I'll be like, hey, I go, these guys love me. And she's like, they don't know you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. all right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. The, you know, the best way to handle it is you got to go watch Mr. Rogers. What? <laughs> no, what is why? He delivered everything the way we should treat each other. Oh yeah. It's just oh, listen, I, I listen, character. I always, whenever somebody does something, like I'm always I always like drop almost drop what I'm doing. Hey bro, yeah, absolutely. I shake their hand, like, hey, listen, yeah, like no, I don't oh yeah, because I keep thinking to myself, so you know who Jude Law is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Jude, I mean, Jude Law, he's an actor. He's been in a bunch of bunch of stuff. Um, and I have a buddy that was playing cards with him in Vegas next to him. And I remember my buddy said that these girls came up to him when he was playing cards and were like, can we get your, uh, a picture with you real quick? And he goes, I'm fucking playing cards right now. Do you see that? And he gets all, all upset and snide and, and yells at him. I forget what he called him. You know, some he's he's British, so he called them some yeah, British, yeah. you know, um, wankers or whatever. Um, yeah. So and then he's like, God. And and my buddy goes, bro, they just wanted to. And he looks at me as fucking wankers. And what and he looked at my buddy, my buddy's playing cards. And he goes, bro, they just wanted a selfie with you. Yeah. And he goes, he goes fuck them. It's all the fucking time. And the thing if is, is without them, you wouldn't exist. Absolutely. And you're sitting here playing cards. For ten thousand dollars a hand in Vegas, your whole life is because of those people. I know. You give them, you give them a, give them a photo, bro. What are you doing? Give all of them. Give them, give them the photo and tell them, hey, I want to. Like this is like if I ever hit that kind of level, the only the thing I want to do, I literally am pulling it from Mister Rogers' book, is is is, is it, or documentary rather, is can I take one too? Right. Oh yeah. That's, yeah. That's good. Oh, and post it, post it. Yeah. Then, they, then they tell all their buddies. Exactly. But you know what? Because that's what it's about. It's about being kind to each other. Because, because you know, when you go outside the four walls that you're in right now, you don't know what's out there. We never know. Mm-hmm. And there's guys, there's 
people out there who want to screw us. I, I grew up in this fantasy land that like, you know, everything was roses and, and, you know, holy crap, my family friends, J Lo's music producer, and he wants me to come over and hang out. Next thing I know, his friends are putting my stuff on HBO, <laughs> you know, like, I, like, I don't know how else to put it, but like, I didn't think they were out to get me. I thought this guy, I looked up to him. Right. You no, know, these were like, I thought that I just thought everything was like good, you know, and you, the and the world woke up and hit me in the face pretty hard. <laughs> but and listen, and I and I always, I always found the the criminal mentality to be interesting because like we all have it, you know, unless you're like completely a a, a robot to the system, right? Like you're always thinking like, well, if something, if I'm in this coffee shop and somebody came in here right now and hit this place, like, how am I getting out of here? Like that's, yeah. you know? Yeah. Or if you, you know, if you're in a business, most of the time, if you're, especially you're in financial businesses, my, my mind's always working. I'm like, wow, like this is all they're doing to verify this. Like for this could be fake. Like, they yeah. could, that could be a fake. like I'm about to wire this money. Like that could be a fake account. This is it. Like, I don't know that guy. Like, there's yeah, there's there's all kinds of like you from inside the system you start to see, and that that was my whole I know I that's it's hard not to see them because right. you know what then you start to think about the process, like you know, unless you're unless you just aren't capable of comprehending, we've all had the thoughts, but like capitalism incentivizes that, and unfortunately, it incentivizes it to the point where everything's making a deal at the end, right? So, like when it came down to it, you had to turn over the money. But like, I was listening. I was listening to your show with the with the guy who had who had all the pot, and he was talking about how he how he yeah, had yeah. the gold bars. And I was like, dude, you should have been like, I don't have any money, man. <laughs> I don't well, know you, what you guys are talking about. What did I tell you? What ended up happening when we were when we were? It's funny because he said on camera he was like, he was like, yeah, they wanted me to cooperate. I wouldn't do it. I said I'd rather die. I'd rather die than do that. I was like, yeah, you're yeah, wrong about was, that. But like, right. you know what? It's, it's all about making a deal. It's like, well, what's in it? For, you know, unfortunately, like, listen, the, the, even the, my, my thinking, my thinking goes back somewhat biblical too. like thou shall not murder. Right. Right. So if, if thou shall not murder and, and, and then there's two people in the street and in, in the hood, in the projects and one person shoots another dead, that's a, that's a tragedy. Right. But now if one of them becomes a police officer that's that's like you know it somehow becomes legal and then if one of them happened to be a police officer against an undercover police officer all of a sudden it's a tragedy again and then like you know you could keep like working yeah but like well, and you're end, also talking about murder like at the end of the day it's yeah but murder at the end of the day, someone's yeah. killing someone right and that's and that no matter what it's wrong i don't know sometimes people need killing but <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> um, but it becomes that me versus you now. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's I think just, sometimes there's justifiable homicide. Um, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, I forget how we, I don't even know how we got onto this. I'm, I'm good at doing that. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 This is no good. Yeah. Maybe we'll cut that part. <laughs> I listen. I know. I know. In Colby, he won't cut that part. Yeah, no. I, know. Funny, I never watch these videos. Like I almost never watch my videos because I'm like, I just, I just, just, I, I just watch F Boy Island, and I know they took it. <laughs> I'm pulling the Chappelle. I'm I'm boycotting until I get credited. Listen, I watched, I watched War Dogs one time. Oh yeah, like one time, just be in it. <laughs> Everybody that. says that. I love that movie. But you know what else is just as good and on parody is uh, Charlie Wilson's War. Oh, that's a that's that's an amazing movie. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love those. I put those movies in the same regard, though. Like they're that's like so horrible. <laughs> what are you talking about? There's no. They are though when you really think about it, right? Because they're just cutting a deal. It's all cutting a deal. Yeah, but. Um. Charlie, the, the Charlie Wilson's war is like, you know, it's, it's based on, at least it's factual. All right, fine. We can throw one more in the mix. Uh, what? And now I'm going to forget the name of the Dearest Lord of War. Yeah. I love that one. That's a great one. That is a great one. The, and the other one, the other one is uh, wag the dog. 
I was, nobody knows what that movie is. I was telling my, my uh, wife about that movie the other day. And she's like, what? I was like, yeah, they invent like a whole country. They invent a scenario just to boost, you know, boost the ratings and it, and, and it works. And, and I'm like, and when the movie came out, it was like, so over the top, but the truth is it's not that over the not top. Not that anymore. far. And like, that's my premise here. That's what I'm trying to do. Whether I, whether I, all I want to do is show that to the people like, look, be careful of what media you consume. Be careful of what media you consume because it's so easy to fake it. Go watch Fake Famous. They make it look like it was done over the course of a year. But I'm telling you, they filmed that shit in three days. Oh, listen, I did. There's a program that did. There's a program called. It's called um, Inside the Mind of a Con Artist. Yeah. And they did a one. They did a one hour episode on me. When you watch it. They think I went to Iceland. They, they, they make it look like I flew into Iceland. They pick me up at the airport. They drive me through Iceland to this scientific um, institute. They call it the institute. We're located in Iceland, and it's, it's, it's very remote. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm in this institute. And they're doing all these tests to me and everything. I never went to Iceland. And they have, they pitch it like a documentary. Like I didn't go to Iceland. I, I went to, I, I went to uh, Amsterdam and they shot it in a, in a, in a, um, in a museum that was closed down and on the back set. And that was it. And they keep saying, well, welcome to the Institute. And I'm thinking. Dude, what Institute? Yeah. What? We're in a studio. Like <laughs> but that's what, but that's the thing. That's like, and that's what I'm trying to say. Like, it's so dangerous, you know, like, the media has the media's power and control over all of us is is frightening. Right. You know, we don't even know they're they're lying to us for all we know. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I, I knew what I always love is when they're it comes out that they are lying and they 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 won't admit it. Or or they put it on page oh, seven. Love me. There's a little thing on page seven where they admit that they lie. Well, when you told the lie, it was on the front page. Yeah. <laughs> but now that you realize, yeah, you know what? Turns out that it, that wasn't true. Okay. Well, then put the redaction on page seven in the upper corner in a, in, in four, four pair or, you know, in, in a, in a small three sentence paragraph. It doesn't and seem then like if it's really, really bad, like the Fox dominion thing, they have a scapegoat and they cut a guy like Tucker Carlson and they're like, look, we did good. That's like, yeah. that's what they do in a really horrible case. And now that guy's out of a job and has to figure out how to provide for his family again. You know, it's like. Oh, listen, he's got a huge base. He's probably going to make more money now than he I'm ever sure made. I'm sure. and, I'm, and, by, and but, but, you know, you put a guy out of work, it's like, it's no different than killing him. No, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I mean, you know, it's to be cut in any manner is it's humiliating. It's like, and no. not just that, like you knew, you knew, like you didn't, I didn't have carte blanche to put whatever I wanted on the news. You knew the management knew, and now they have to backpedal. It's like the uh, the Bud Light thing. We didn't know that yeah. she was gonna launch a national campaign. Come on, bro. You that's, gave her that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say here. It's like, can everybody just like just just listen? All I all I want to do is all the people who care enough about their life, just don't stop watching the stop watching so much media. Like Pick and choose what you're taking in because it's no different than what you watch and consume. You're consuming. You know, like, just like protect yourself a little bit. Like we all, my generation, I can't stand, I can't go on a date without like, I'm competing with your fucking phone. Like, I'm like, no, I'm never going to meet anybody. <laughs> you know, like, like, how can I date you if I have to compete with like a device? Right. Look, do you see what this one's doing? You know how many of those days I've been on? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and then you think all of a sudden if they put the phone away, you're like, wait a minute, this is a good one. And then they're a train wreck. <laughs> well, what are you doing now? I'm suing HBO. No, I <laughs> <laughs> what else are you doing? What are, what else are yes. you working on? That's, I mean, I've really fully focused on this for like the last two years of my life. And like some people would say I've wasted it, but I really think I'm going to do a good thing here. 
I really want to bring awareness to this. And like, and I know that it's like a pretty generic thing people might skate over, but I want to, I want people to understand what you're consuming is, is so evil. Right. You know, and, and, and unfortunately it comes down to the consumer because the consumer you'd remember, you'd remember, um, LimeWire. Yeah. So LimeWire, Thank most you. kids my Thank age you. don't, but, but I remember LimeWire being a thing. So <laughs> I was on the cutting edge of technology. So you were what three? <laughs> I was probably in the fourth grade. Yeah. So, so were you on the phone? Were you, what were you doing? <laughs> you no, know, we had a, we had a gateway computer in the basement that we were allowed to use for like an hour after school. Like, you know, however, however my parents right. set the goals and like my cousin, from California was like, yeah, you got to check this thing out. It's called LimeWire. <laughs> He's in third grade. What are you doing, you weirdo? Here, smoke this. Don't tell, <laughs> you, don't tell, don't tell your mom. She's <laughs> like, you can get everything you want. Just go on LimeWire. You can download it. And so all of a sudden, but anyhow, that was always the problem with, with, the, with, the, the, with the entertainment business is the consumer is stealing the product. They're always willing to take the product because everybody wants to be entertained. Mm -hmm. so, okay, so I get that you. I, I understand. I'm going to cut you off. You, right. you I get that. You're, <laughs> I get that you're you're suing these people or yeah. you're suing HBO. But what oh, I'm so trying to launch a production, my production company. Uh, okay, I have my own works that are like totally up and they're ready to pitch and ready to go, sort of thing. Um, I want to make a couple of movies. That's kind of where I'm at. Uh, on your, when you say on your own thing, what do you mean? Like, are, are these just uh, ideas you have, scripts you've written? Are they have, most of them are probably like ready for pitch format. They're like super rough, but ready to be pitched. They're not scripts yet. But like, you know, I want to like put the teams together and build my, I want to be, you know, I want to be a movie producer. Okay. My goal is my, I'm working towards being a movie producer. Okay. I'd like, and I'm looking for a studio that like, you know, like one of these other, I guess it's, I guess I might not have an, I might work, work a deal with Warner now, but like, I might not. And if I didn't, like, I'd be looking at like Universal or Sony because those are the other two in the oligopoly. Right. Um, I mean, my dream for it all would be that I collected a dollar off of every American and I started a network that was more like a, 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 a PBS sort of a thing where, where you could actually come and, and it would be fully self-sufficient. Right. Because look, the stock market works out. The stock market works. If you collected a dollar off every American, it'd be 300 million bucks roughly. And if that's making 8% a year in a, in a, in a traditional, you know, fund, if you spent 4% a year on making new content, you could give people content for free. You know, it's just that people aren't managing the money properly. And like, you know, if people want to be entertained for free, then so be it. Give it to them. But then you get to make your money other places, selling merchandise, selling ad, selling ad, you know, advertising revenue. So if I like really had it my way and this thing went crazy and I gained a ton of traffic, that's what I would love to raise money to do. It's a big dream. <laughs> that's all I know how to do is think big. Um, huh. So what are the projects? Uh, pitch project? I'm worried about getting them stolen. <laughs> I, that's too bad. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, have you already done sizzle reels or? No, no, nothing's that far down the pipes. Everything's everything's just ready for pitch format. Because, you know, the truth of the matter is I learned from these guys at GFY, you could sell anything on paper. They, right. You know, they, they, as long as it's like good enough on paper, you should be able to sell it. I'm very, uh, I'm not very, um, I'm, I'm very casual. Okay. Yeah. That, me too. And listen, and the guy that called me for you, I, I forget his name. Jesse. Je like, like, listen, he, I thought, I, I thought someone from the white house was calling me. I mean, he was like, <laughs> he was so professional. I mean, he, he rattled it off so quickly. You know, I was driving my car and I was like, and all I could think to say was, wow, that was extremely professional. Like, I don't know who you are. I don't know why you're calling. <laughs> But I definitely feel like I need to take the call. 
I want to, I feel like I need to pull over and kind of like straighten up my shirt to just to be on the phone call with the guy. And I said, that was extremely <laughs> professional. He said, well, I tried to do my best. I was just like, that was, that was even a great, a better response. Like he just, and I was like, who, who, who is this? Like, what's going on again? Like I was, so then he told me, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, guys, yeah, I'm on the way to the studio right now. So, um, let me introduce you. And it, it's, it's Pugy. Pugy. Yeah. It's a tough one. P-U-G. Pugy. Pugy. Okay. Nine. Um, all right, Jack Pugy. Hold on a second. Let me do. Okay, let me let me do my intro. This is silly. You'll see. Um, hey, if you guys like the video, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Share the video. Um, share the channel. Leave me a comment. And I wrote a bunch of true crime books when I was locked up. And uh, so check out the trailers. Using forgeries and bogus identities, Matthew B. Cox, one of the most ingenious con men in history, built America's biggest banks out of millions. Despite numerous encounters with bank security, state, and federal authorities, Cox narrowly, and quite luckily, avoided capture for years. Eventually, he topped the U.S. Secret Service's most wanted list and led the U.S. Marshals, FBI, and Secret Service on a three-year chase while jet-setting around the world with his attractive female accomplices. Cox has been declared one of the most prolific mortgage fraud con artists of all time by CNBC's American Greed. Bloomberg Businessweek called him the mortgage industry's worst nightmare, while Dateline NBC described Cox as a gifted forger and silver-tongued liar. Playboy magazine proclaimed his scam was real estate fraud, and he was the best. Shark in the Housing Pool is Cox's exhilarating first-person account of his stranger-than-fiction story. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Bent is the story of John J. Boziak's phenomenal life of crime. Inked from head to toe, with an addiction to strippers and fast Cadillacs, Boziak was not your typical computer geek. He was, however, one of the most cunning scammers, counterfeiters, identity thieves, and escape artists alive, and a major thorn in the side of the U.S. Secret Service as they fought a war on cybercrime. With a savant-like ability to circumvent banking security and stay one step ahead of law enforcement, Boziak made millions of dollars in the international cyber underworld with the help of the Chinese and the Russians. Then, leaving nothing but a John Doe warrant and a cleaned-out bank account in his wake, he vanished. Boziak's stranger-than-fiction tale of ingenious scams and impossible escapes, of brazen run-ins with the law and secret desires to straighten out and settle down, makes his story a true crime con game that will keep you guessing. Bent. How a homeless teen became one of the cybercrime industry's most prolific counterfeiters. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Buried by the U.S. government and ignored by the national media, this is the story they don't want you to know. When Frank Amadeo met with President George W. Bush at the White House to discuss NATO operations in Afghanistan, no one knew that he'd already embezzled nearly $200 million from the federal government, money he intended to use to bankroll his plan to take over the world. From Amadeo's global headquarters in the shadow of Florida's Disney World, with a nearly inexhaustible supply of the Internal Revenue Service's funds, Amadeo acquired multiple businesses, amassing a mega conglomerate. Driven by his delusions of world conquest, he negotiated the purchase of a squadron of American fighter jets and the controlling interest in a former Soviet ICBM factory. He began work to build the largest private militia on the planet, over one million Africans strong. Simultaneously, Amadeo hired an international black ops force to orchestrate a coup in the Congo while plotting to take over several small Eastern European countries. The most disturbing part of it all is, had the US government not thwarted his plans, he might have just pulled it off. It's insanity. The bizarre, true story of a bipolar megalomaniac's insane plan for total world domination. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Pierre Rossini in the 1990s, 
was a 20-something-year-old Los Angeles-based drug trafficker of ecstasy and ice. He and his associates drove luxury European supercars, lived in Beverly Hills penthouses, and dated Playboy models while dodging federal indictments. Then, two FBI officers with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force entered the picture. Dirty agents willing to fix cases and identify informants. Suddenly, two of Rossini's associates, confidential informants working with federal law enforcement, were murdered. Everyone pointed to Rossini. As his co-defendants prepared for trial, U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller sat down to debrief Rossini at Leavenworth Penitentiary, and another story emerged. A tale of FBI corruption and complicity in murder. You see, Pierre Rossini knew something that no one else knew. The truth. And Robert Mueller and the federal government have been covering it up to this very day. Devil Exposed. A twisted tale of drug trafficking, corruption, and murder in the City of Angels. Available on Amazon and Audible. Bailout is a psychological true crime thriller that pits a narcissistic con man against an egotistical pathological liar. Marcus Shrinker, the money manager who attempted to fake his own death during the 2008 financial crisis, is about to be released from prison and he's ready to talk. He's ready to tell you the story no one's heard. Shrinker sits down with true crime writer Matthew B. Cox, a fellow inmate serving time for bank fraud. Shrinker lays out the details. The disgruntled clients who persecuted him for unanticipated market losses, the affair that ruined his marriage, and the treachery of his scorned wife, the woman who framed him for securities fraud, leaving him no choice but to make a bogus distress call and plunge from his multi-million dollar private aircraft in the dead of night. The $11.1 million in life insurance, the missing $1.5 million in gold. The fact is, Shrinker wants you to think he's innocent. The problem is, Cox knows Shrinker's a pathological liar and his story's a fabrication. As Cox subtly coaxes, cajoles, and yes, cons Shrinker into revealing his deceptions, his stranger-than-fiction life of lies slowly unravels. This is the story Shrinker didn't want you to know. Bailout, The Life and Lies of Marcus Shrinker. Available now on Barnes & Noble, Etsy, and Audible. Matthew B. Cox is a con man, incarcerated in the Federal Bureau of Prisons for a variety of bank fraud-related scams. Despite not having a drug problem, Cox inexplicably ends up in the prison's residential drug abuse program, known as RDAP. A drug program in name only, RDAP is an invasive behavior modification therapy specifically designed to correct the cognitive thinking errors associated with criminal behavior. The program is a non-fiction dark comedy which chronicles Cox's side-splitting journey this first-person account is a fascinating glimpse at the survivor-like atmosphere inside of the government-sponsored rehabilitation unit. While navigating the treachery of his backstabbing peers, Cox simultaneously manipulates prison policies and the bumbling staff every step of the way. The Program How a Con Man Survived the Federal Bureau of Prisons' Cult of RDAP Available now on Amazon and Audible. If you saw anything you like, links to all the books are in the description box.